This is Jocko Podcast number 110 with Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. All sciences have principles and rules. War has none. The great captains who have written of it give us none. Extreme cleverness is required to even understand them. And it is impossible to base any judgment on the relations of the historias, historians, for they only speak of war as their imaginations paint it. As for the great captains who have written of it, they have attempted rather to be interesting than instructive, since the mechanics of war is dry and tedious. Books dealing with it have small success, and their merit will not be recognized except after the passage of time. Those writing historically of war have better luck. They are sought by all the curious and kept in the all libraries. That is why we only have a confused idea of the discipline of the Greeks and Romans. War is a science covered with shadows in whose obscurity one cannot move with an assured step. Routine and prejudice, the natural result of ignorance, are its foundation and support. Nothing is so disgraceful as slavishness to custom. This is both a result of ignorance and a proof of it. Chevalier Foulard supposes all men to be brave at all times and does not realize that the courage of the troops must be reborn daily that nothing is so variable, and that the true skill of a general consists of knowing how to guarantee it by his dispositions, his positions, and those traits of genius that characterize great captains. Perhaps he reserved of this immense, dis- perhaps he reserved discussion of this immense subject, and perhaps also it escaped him. Nevertheless, it is of all the elements of war the one that is most necessary to study. The same troops who, if attacking, would have been victorious, may be invariably defeated in entrenchments. Few men have accounted for it in a reasonable manner, for it lies in human hearts, and one should search for it there." No one has written of this matter, which is of the most importance, the most learned, and the most profound of the profession of war. And without a knowledge of the human heart, one is dependent upon the favor of fortune, which sometimes is very inconstant. So those are some opening words from a book called Reveries on War by Maurice de Saxe. This guy's a character, Maurice de Saxe. True. You did a little research on him. A little did you bit. did you find out how much of a character he was? No, no probably. He was not a too. serious character. There's a couple things, there's a couple things even in that opening right there that I wasn't sure if I was going to cover this and I was kind of like going back to it to see if it was something we should cover. Mm. But I I just when you get right here, all sciences have principles and rules. War has none. That's a true statement. And it's true that there's, you know, there's principles of warfare, but there's no actual rules. Like, you can do whatever you want. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you can say the Geneva Convention, but then you can just defy it and just, right. you know, you can do things that are completely opposed to it. Yeah. So there's no rules. You should do whatever you want to win. Yeah. Now, you could lose your respect and you could act inhumane and that might cost you in the long run, but if war is war. There's no other thing like that, Mm. right? There's no Mm. other thing like that. Do whatever you want. I guess if you had a, if you had like a street fight with no weapons and someone's going to do whatever they could to win, right? It's the same. It's that's war. It's It's the the same thing. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, when you deal with like death, is kind of the goal and the consequence at the same time. Like death, that's the end of the line. So yeah, anything goes essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing else is like that. Then he says this. Nothing is so disgraceful as slavishness to custom. That's a bold statement, too. Mm-hmm. I agree. Disgraceful, he calls it. He talks about these prejudices that people have. I think you call them, what do you call them? Biases. Biases, right? Cognitive biases. He talks about, he doesn't talk about that, but he talks about them. But this guy was a character. He lived from 
1696 to 1750, he started off as a German soldier in the army of the Holy Roman Empire, which was like this bunch of territories in Europe that were banded together under that name, and they were around for a long time, from like the Middle Ages until the time of the Napoleonic Wars, so you know the, the early 1800s. And he served also served in the Imperial Army, which was another kind of army that often fought alongside the army of the Holy, Holy Roman Empire. And he, but, he, but the weird thing is, is he finished his career as the Marshal General of France. And so, so he had kind of, I guess you could say he kind of switched sides, but he rose, rose up through the ranks. Mm. Because his military career started at the age of 13 <laughs> when he fought at the Battle of Malpaquet. I think that's how you say it. Which and that th- that war that battle right there was that was between the army of the Holy Ro- Roman Empire and France, so he was on both sides at mm-hmm. s- certain points of his life, and I think the whole time he was it seems like from what I read about him he was always kind of looking to r- go up the social structure mm-hmm. you know ra- rise up in the social structure and become more a powerful person mm-hmm. in the hierarchy sure. of, Dominance, of right. those times in the dominance hierarchy. Mm-hmm. So yeah, he started fighting at age thirteen. Which, by the way, I, that's just so cool. I don't. I'm sorry if you think I'm a bad person, but as far as I'm concerned, if I could have joined the military at thirteen, I would have been so stoked. Uh, sorry, everyone that's that doesn't agree with that. That's just how I roll. I'm just telling the truth on that one. And actually, as I look back on my life, if I could have done that, would have been even better. Mm. I think they should allow people to join the military. They should have some like youth corps. Yeah, where you yeah. can go in mm-hmm. and just get after it yeah. at a young age. Just prep, just learn. But they think a, a uh, they think a thirteen year old can't make that decision, and they're right. The thirteen year old can't make that decision, so you'd have to have really benevolent people that were in charge of them, in charge of these troops. Yeah. And you also think that an eighteen year old person can make a good decision, but that's not true yeah, either, because you got eighteen people that are dumber than dirt yeah. and make bad decisions. Yeah. And people are worried that you're going to get thoughts put into your head. Yeah. Yeah, you will. You are. You are, and guess what? If they're good thoughts, right on. That's not a bad thing, right? Yeah, but. I mean, do you have to learn everything yourself? Is that the way the world works? You can't have good ideas put into your head? You can't get a little bit programmed? Yeah, you If you could get programmed to be a better human being, would you accept that programming? Yeah, of course, but. Okay, I'm just checking. Because you're over there looking like I'm a bad person because I'm trying to brainwash you. No, because you're just saying the word good and better, like there's this universal good and better. I think there is. No, there is. I mean, there is, but it's so narrow. Next time we have Jordan B. Peterson on here, you can converse that. You can can have a conversation with him about that. How do you say say that you don't know that there's universal good and there's universal bad? no, no, no. I'm saying. I mean, we could come up with dozens saying. of things right now no. that we know are good and bad. Y- yes. Right? I, I don't Hurt know about a dozen. child. Is that good or bad? No. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. For you sure. You see where I'm going? This take yes. mo- take something that doesn't belong to you, good or bad. Yeah. But those they're so basic and fundamental that okay. you don't you don't need a youth corps to. Well, there's a lot of people out there that, that don't get taught that stuff, uh, and that's true too. But that's a whole different issue. Okay. Well, I'm just making sure. Yeah, but if you're, yeah, I know what you're saying how you're saying good, like good ideas and good idea. You're talking about your way <laughs> specifically, which I dig. No, no, no. But I I'm would not. Saying. I would not. And I still, I even, you know, I get in trouble for this because, uh-huh. for instance, people say, "Oh, you shouldn't wake up at four thirty in the morning," and and I always say, "Like, yeah, I know." <laughs> so I'm not saying you have to wake up at four thirty in the morning. I'm saying yeah. wake up earlier. Yeah. Don't be lazy. Yeah. Right. Uh-huh. I'm not saying you have to. I say, you know, don't eat donuts. Right? Sure. I'm not saying you can never taste anything that tastes good. I'm just saying, be smart, man. Come on. You don't need a donut. And yeah. donuts are re- actually on the evil. They might just be pure evil, too, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> right? Very, very well. Donuts? Yeah, sure. Come yeah. on, man. Possibly. Donuts don't eat, they don't even make you feel. I mean, is there any, do you get any satisfaction from a donut? Satisfaction? Well, it depends on what you mean by satisfaction. Oh, man. You but always want to try and parse these things. Well, down. you can't. I'm it's not you, an absolute thing. Okay, so I guess you get a, a 10 second good yeah. taste in your mouth. Yeah, Sugar yeah, yeah. rush. Yeah. Get some. So, and. Technically, and you pay for that, yeah, for oh, your yeah. health and fitness for sure. So if you don't seem to care. No, who me? Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, man, I care. I care a lot. Okay, I'm just making I'm, sure. I'm trying to. I'm trying to look at it from all angles. Satisfaction, yeah, technically and biologically. Okay, but you, you could come up with some fundamental good things. And I'll tell you this: the military does teach some fundamental good things. Yeah. So if I could have joined at the age of 13, it would have been good for me. I would have been stoked. Actually, I would have missed out on some cool stuff too because I had some fun back yeah. in the jury and I did some <laughs> cool stuff that actually led to me. Being who I am today, you know, I learned I some d- stuff. I dig it, man. But not what I'm saying. The point is, is that your way 
not everyone will agree. I agree with you. Oh, okay. And I'm sure a bunch of people yeah, do, yeah. but I'm just saying there's yeah. like different, different No, I people. guess I'm not pro universal brainwashing to my yeah. methods of living. Method, yeah. I'm not and I'm not which makes 13 year old by the way. Yeah, which is 13 year old. Now, I'll tell you, I just said that that going in the military I would have missed out on some things, you know, maybe some growing up experiences. Uh, Marista Sachs didn't miss out on a on a damn thing because yeah. he was getting after it in many different ways, mm. not only on the battlefield but also as a a little bit of a maniac. He was he, first of all he was like apparently a physically he was kind of a beast of a man and like physically, mm. and he fought he he kind of proved himself he distinguished himself in in some big battles as he was 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 years old. Apparently he could bend a horseshoe. With his hand, and it, and I, I was looking at that. I was thinking to myself, he. They mean hands, right? They must mean hands. Plural. <laughs> yeah, of course. It didn't say that. It said hand. hand. And I didn't want to take anything away from him. So apparently, he could grab a. He was big and could mm-hmm. grab a horseshoe and just bend it in one hand. Damn. So he had some some serious strength, and through his life, he commanded companies, which he actually refers to as centuries, which. If you can imagine century, we know that means a hundred. So a century, it like the ancient Roman army had centuries mm-hmm. instead of companies, and they weren't even a hundred people; they were like eighty people. But mm-hmm. he led those. He led regiments and he led whole armies, and he fought with a lot of success throughout his career. Now, with that, that being said, he was far from what anyone would actually consider a role model because. He, the way he lived his personal life was not exactly exemplarily. Exemplarily, I didn't say that word right. Exemplary. Yes. Exemplar. That one. In, in fact, well, the way he lived his life was probably the opposite of role model. Yeah. So he was forced into marriage at the age of eighteen. He didn't want to get married mm-hmm. because he was. I think he was a, a, too much of a womanizer and said, "I don't want to get married." Mm-hmm. But he married this heiress, fourteen-year-old heiress, Dang. with a ton of money. He blew all her money. And he was 18, she was 14. He was 14. 18, she was 14. She, she was an heiress with a bunch of money. He took all her money and blew it on horses for his regiment and on women, Dang. mistresses. And then he had a bunch of public affairs and everyone kind of knew about it and the marriage got annulled and he continued this kind of wanton behavior, I think, throughout his life. And a couple times he's hypocritical because in the book he talks about certain types of people and I don't know if I cover it, but he, he does come across a little bit hypocritical hypocritical sometimes now I think one of this is this a uh, one quote I grabbed from this mistress this kind of famous mistress actually she's recognized as the chief mistress of King Louis the 15th so did you know that the king had like not just mistresses we know that but there's a chief mistress who's mm-hmm. known yeah, right? yeah, I, yeah. Uh, her name was Madame <clears throat> de Pompadour and this is what she said about sax Maurice de Sachs does not understand anything about the delicacy of love. The only pleasure he takes in the society of women can be summed up in one word, debauchery. So, he's a little bit out of control. He might have, in fact, inherited his lifestyle choices from his dad, whose name was Frederick Augustus, who was well known for his personal unbridled lust sure. how do you know that he had unbridled lust well case in point maurice was the eldest so maurice de Sachs was the eldest of 354 acknowledged illegitimate children Dang. that frederick fathered <laughs> so while we might not want to emulate maurice de Sachs's personal life he was an experienced and successful leader of men on the battlefield and we can learn from him and with that let's go back to the book and here's Maurice de Sachs a man who has that a talent for architecture and can design will draw the plan and perspective of a palace with great skill But if he is to execute it, if he does not know how to shape his stones, to lay his foundation, the whole edifice will crash soon. It is the same with a general who does not know the principles of his art, nor how to organize his troops, for these are indispensable qualifications in all the operations of war. The prodigious 
success with which the Romans always gained with small armies against multitudes of barbarians can be attributed to nothing but the excellent composition of their troops. Not that I would infer from this that a man of genius will not be able to succeed even at the head of an army of Tartars. It is much, this is the, this is the interesting part, it is much easier to take men as they are than to make them as they should be. It is difficult to reconcile opinions, prejudice, prejudices, and passions. So there's a couple interesting things. I also forgot to point out that he wrote this kind of on a whim, and he actually starts off this, this whole book. Kind of, He says, this work was not born from a desire to establish a new method of the art of war. It was composed to amuse and instruct myself. And then one of the last things he says in the book is to the readers i wrote this book in 13 nights i was sick thus it very probably shows the fever i had this should supply my excuses for the irregularity of the arrangement as well as the inelegance of the style i wrote militarily to and to dissipate my boredom now on top of those that excuse right on top of that he was a big opium user Mm. so we're figuring he was probably writing this in an impaired state Sure. We're dealing with it. We're not we're not mad about it, but we're realistic And I, the reason I say this is because some of the writing is a little bit tricky and some run-on sentences and yeah, so we, we have to pu- we have to pull a little bit harder sure. to get some nuggets yeah, 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 But there's plenty of nuggets and I think that's one of them It's much easier to take men as they are than to make them as they should be and where I look at that as a leader You get people that are good at something mm-hmm. And you get someone that's not good at something but they're good at something else. You put people where you can use them. You put people where their skills are most available and where they can where they can perform their duties to the highest level because they're naturally good at it. That's yeah. all it's saying. I'm yeah. not having you proofread my writing at night, right? Yeah, no. No. <laughs> no, I'm not. No. And I'm not over here trying to make videos. No, no. you're not. No, I'm not. No. Right? That you see where I'm going with this? Yes. So you're right. it would it it'd be easier if you said, you know what, Jocko, when it comes to the podcast, why don't you come up with the talking, a bunch of talking, and I'll make cool videos, right? Yeah. We kind of did that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Otherwise, we people would be listening to you <laughs> talking about movies from nineteen eighty eight. And comparing them to stuff. Yeah, very, very clunky. Which yeah. is, you know, it's fine. Yeah. But and then wouldn't you have to expend more resources on your part to to coach me up? Yes. Right? So and like, imagine, Dang. yeah, and and I'd be trying to make videos, which I can, and I'd be have to coach, which you would make up. me mad. Yeah. <laughs> we don't want that. No, it would make me mad because it's dealing with computers and stuff. Yeah. yeah I don't mind bad. computers, but I don't like them. Sure. No. So. Yeah. Yeah. But that's a that's a big part of like why he's saying it though, right? Because yes. it's like it's like you're gonna save yourself a lot of time and headache exactly. when you're trying to coach these hey, guys up and when this you, stuff. When you get to the SEAL teams, it's like, oh, you're small, a small guy, cool. You're gonna be a point man. Yeah, yeah. You're a big guy, mm-hmm. cool. You're gonna carry an, uh, an M60 or mm-hmm. a now it's a Mark 48. That's yeah. what that's how it's happening. We're not gonna take the small guy and try and get bulk him, him bulk up, him up yeah. and make him taller and bigger and stronger. Mm-hmm. And we're not gonna take the big guy and starve him. Yeah. And send him to ranger school so he loses 38 pounds <laughs> and he comes back and like okay you're a point man now no yeah, yeah let, let's let's use nature and he's he talks about that in other places all right he's talking about in this section how to uh, how to raise an army basically how do you make an army and I thought this one was a little bit interesting because people ask me this question all the time he's talking about mandatory service and this is his opinion on it Would it not be better to prescribe by law that every man, whatever his condition in life, should be obliged to serve his prince and his country for five years? That's that's no joke. Sometimes people say two years, and that seems reasonable, and a lot of countries do that. He says five years, and it's kind of funny, his attitude towards five years. Back to the book. This law could not be objected to because it is natural and just that all citizens should occupy themselves with the defense of the nation. Concur. No inconvenience could result if they were chosen between the ages of 20 and 30 years. These are all the years of libertinage. When youth seeks its fortune, travels the country, and is of little comfort to parents. 
<laughs> this would not be a public calamity because one could be sure that when five years had passed, discharge would be granted. So he's saying, look, people couldn't be mad about it because it's only five years. And he's also saying, look, this is when your kids are out of control anyways. Yeah, you might as well time. have them in the military. There's that that whole idea of the libertine that took place back in the day. And these guys were you know, basically wild morally getting after it or I should they were they were they were they were partying wicked hard yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to think of a good way to say it yeah, yeah. they were partying yeah. wicked hard with drugs booze and women yeah the libertines yeah. and they that was they called them a rake like if a guy a guy that was out there with a bunch of different women all the time yeah. they'd be called a rake there's a bunch of period novels that I had to read read when I was in college that's why I know about it sure. about these Libertine rakes. rakes So he continues on this method of raising troops would provide an inexhaustible reservoir of fine recruits who would not be subject to desertion in Course of time as a consequence. It would be regarded as an honor to have fulfilled one service I'd say that's probably accurate But to produce this effect it is essential to make no distinctions to be immovable on this point and to enforce the law particularly on the nobles and the rich then no one will complain. Hey, you gotta, if you're gonna do it to one person, you gotta do it to everyone equally. Mm. Consequently, those who had not served their time will scorn those who are reluctant to obey the law, and insensibly, it will become an honor to serve. The poor bourgeois, who will be consoled by the example of the rich, and the rich will not dare complain upon seeing the noble serve. Arms is an honorable profession. How many princes have borne arms? Now, what's interesting about this idea is that there's some people in the world that aren't really meant for warfare. Mm. And so should we let nature, I, 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 more, I more heavily agree with the previous point. Mm. You should let people do what they're good at naturally. Mm-hmm. So you're gonna end up recruiting people that might not be good at this naturally, yeah. and that's not a good thing. But not everyone goes to war, right? I mean, no, you're right. You could you put know, them like, in different jobs. Yeah, yeah, that's that's absolutely true. Yeah. They could put the the guy that's more uh, more apt to be like good at writing. He could become a military journalist or yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you're right. You know, people always ask me that question, and the bottom line is. It's a tough one. I'm sure I don't have like a, some hardcore stance on it one way or the other. Yeah. Do I think it would benefit everyone, every 18-year-old, if they join the military? It would benefit them. Yeah. I'm telling you it would benefit them. Do I think it should be mandatory? I don't really think so because I don't want to have a bunch of draftees in the military. And if you don't want to join and you want to miss out on having that part in your life, that's your call and that's fine. This is America. You can do what you want. Yeah, that makes sense, huh? Because on one, on one hand, you kind of can look at it as like taxes, right? Where how, just like how DeSax was saying, um, you know, you, you have to have the, the I'm paraphrasing, the, the, the pleasure or the honor to serve in one's, your country's defense. Mm-hmm. You know, like that, that should be obvious. It's mm-hmm. obvious. And so it's kind of like cons- compare it with paying taxes, right? Taxes go to public service like yeah. for all this stuff. And we live in this country. We have public service. We all have to pay for it. It's not just one person. Yeah. We all pay taxes. Well, a lot of people pay a lot more than other people. Yeah, taxes. exactly. Right. A and lot more. Yeah. I, I dig it, and some people don't really pay taxes. And that's how the military would have been just, too. You just said everyone pays their taxes. Not everyone pays. I know that. And if just you, FYI. what if, what if, okay, so good. Yeah. Perfect. Exactly. The, Part of my point is, so let's say I'm like, hey, you just paid, your, let's say it's tax time, April 15th, whatever. Some and people pay taxes year round, just FYI. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm just saying, but at the There's time something where something called a quarterly estimate, you don't want none. <laughs> <laughs> I actually know about that now. <laughs> Thank, Get some. Thankfully, or not so thankful. Um, but, you know, let's just say for this example, April 15th, that's when everyone knows it's universal, right, right, right. right? And you're like, yeah, I just pay my taxes, you know, whatever. Like, I didn't like giving my money away, but that's it. You know, just like people in the in a draft situation or, or mandatory mil- yeah. military, I didn't want to. I, I would have rather go be a, a rake yeah. or whatever. And but I'm doing it, and boom, I did it. And then you got me, or maybe not me, someone else saying, "Oh yeah, I didn't pay my taxes." Yeah. Like, and then you're like, "Whoa, wait, wait." So you're saying it becomes an honor to pay your taxes. In a I way, I wish I could agree with you. No, no, no. Because no, there's, to. I think there's a part of your brain. No matter how much you pay for taxes, it is like you do have that feeling. Like, yeah, I, I did my part, even though it sucked, even though it hurt, even though you know I would way rather have spent it on a Disney vacation or something like that. Like, no, I, I would have rather I'm invested a, a it myself into something that was productive right, or right. built more business or something like that. You know, just little things like that. But whatever. Well, you see what I'm saying? No, All you right. know what I mean. 
I hear you. It's kind, kind of the of. same thing. That's one way to look at it, though. Yeah, where you okay. can, but the other, the it other is one way, yes. yeah, yeah. But the other way is you just win. like how you, how you said, if you get some people who are in there in the military with certain like jobs or whatever, and they don't want to be there, yeah. it's kind of like it's kind of too important yeah. to have people like that. Yeah. You know? But you could have, yeah. What you said is actually correct that you could have, you know, elements that just did other things in the military that that would be more aligned with the person's natural yep. uh, desires of what they want to do. Yeah, and then, now there's something in the Navy called needs of the Navy, right? So yeah. you would get a, the, the Navy, you, oh, I want to go get stationed in Hawaii. Yeah. Like, okay, what are the needs of the Navy? Because the needs of the Navy come yeah. first, not you, not your family, nothing. Yeah. And, and so the needs of the Navy come first. Well, yeah, and of course, same thing with like a tax situation where it's like you're, if you don't want to do it, it's kind of hard to be like, I know you don't want to do it, but hey, now that you're here, do what you want. You know, you kind of can't say that. Otherwise, I'll be like, I don't want to be here, so I can choose what I can do. Okay, I'm going to do the the most smallest, most light, least time consuming. Like basically, I'm going to do the the least I possibly can because I don't want to be here to begin. In the military, with. this is the vol- this is the mandatory military. This will go yeah, for yeah, it. Yeah. Yes, and it, that'll go for it. So you're going to get these. It's kind of like uh, yeah. Like so you get people that would be not doing very much. Yeah, it's yeah. essentially a it's, dra- like wait, a yeah. draft dodger kind of situation, but within the you know who didn't actually dodge it. If, if I'm just saying, if it were a scenario like we'll just put them where their interests lie, even though they have to be here. Yeah, you see what I'm saying. So it, I'm just saying that's the other side of the coin where it's like eh, it's hard to make make it work in an absolute kind of way. Check. All right, he talked a little bit about clothing troops, what they should wear, and this is just. I thought this was interesting. Our uniform is not only expensive, but very, very uncomfortable. The soldier is neither shod nor clothed nor covered. The love of appearance prevails over attention to health, and this is one of the most important points demanding our attention. Hair is a dirty ornament for a soldier. <laughs> and once the rainy season has arrived, his head is never dry. So it sounds to me like he's basically saying he doesn't care how he looks. He's here, here to win. To win. <laughs> so hair is a dirty ornament for a soldier. <laughs> In place of hats, I should prefer helmets. As for shoes, this was interesting. You know, people wear minimalistic shoes sure. without, with zero heel to toe drop. Have you heard that zero. expression? No. Meaning it's the same level across. So it's any of the barefoot type shoes. Okay, they, gotcha. they all say, oh, zero, heel to toe, drop. Okay. Meaning there's not an eight millimeter difference between the height of the heel and mm-hmm. then it goes down to the height of the toe. Mm-hmm. This is what he says. As for shoes, I would prefer the soldiers to have shoes of thin leather, leather with low heels instead of heavy boots. They would be perfectly shod and would march with better grace since the low heels would force them to turn out their toes, stretch their joints, and consequently consequently draw in their shoulders. It's pretty interesting because everyone's all in the range of minimalistic shoes, which I actually wear shoes that don't have any heel toe drop. (laughs) Yeah. Maybe I'm caught up in that fad, but. It's cool. But you know what, when we were kids, right, Chuck Taylors? Yeah, Chuck Taylor. Yeah, they have no heel toe drop. People still wear them because huh. they're good to go. That's kind of all right? I will. Mostly all I wear. Yeah. Yeah. Chuck well, Taylor's. there you go. There you go. See, I didn't know you, about you're the heel in, toe. You're thing. the big time trend. <laughs> you're you're a uh, early adopter. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, guess. I didn't know about my the problem heel with toe Chuck Taylors is too narrow for me. Too narrow. Yeah, and they don't sell wide ones. I've looked. All right, pay, what you gotta pay people, back to the book. Without going into detail about the different rates of pay, I shall only say that it should be ample. It is better to have a small number of well-kept and well-disciplined troops than to have a great number who are neglected in these matters. It is not the big armies that win battles, it is the good ones. Economy can be pushed only to a certain point. It has limits beyond which it degenerates into parsimony. I had to look that word up, by the way. Parsimony. parsimony. Yeah, occasionally you get one of those. It means just super cheap. Mm. Super cheap. It's interesting because that doesn't sound like that. My dad what it means. would fall in that category. Parsimony. <laughs> <laughs> what is, so he, if your dad would be considered parsimonious? I guess so. Mm. I know that my my dad, like many dads, will drive an extra 
18 miles to save f- three cents a gallon on gas. Yeah, yeah, is that yeah. is it all dads do that? No. I In Hawaii, it, they don't do that. Well, yeah, you drive eight, 18 miles, you're, you're, in the, you're in the ocean <laughs> most of the time. But yeah, I mean, I've heard of that before. Isn't that like a false thing though? Like, cause you, yeah, you're driving you drove. 18 miles. Yeah, okay. for sure. Kind of part but, of the joke, you know. You get the app that has the cheapest gas prices in your area. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, know? yeah How much good. time are you spending looking at an app that you paid three dollars for to find out where you can <laughs> save two cents a gallon on gas? Yeah. Now get, I get it, man. I'm cheap. I inherited that, right? I mm-hmm. I don't like to spend money. It's hard for me to part with the with the money, right? Mm-hmm. Including the tax, man. By the way, <laughs> it's hard for. So I get it, but I also have to have some, like like sometimes my dad could be irrational about it sure. you know irrational yeah. just yeah. just straight up crazy hey well you could save two cents yeah hey if you know if, he, he, he gets fired up about that too yeah that's another thing you know he always asks me how much the how much the gas out there in california <laughs> i'm like i don't know i'm gonna pay for it anyways let's we'll stick the nozzle in there pull the trigger and rock and roll i got stuff i gotta do i'm not driving oh, yeah. how much cheaper is gas on base mm. he, when i didn't know how much cheaper gas was on base he he was beside himself. Yeah, yeah. And then when he found out it was eight cents a gallon cheaper, he's like, ah, he's "Can all you get me on base? I'm like, oh, you want to <laughs> yeah. go drive over there, wait in line, show your ID, mm-hmm. and then we get on base? You gotta wait because no, yeah. Come on, wait. Isn't Quit that because being parsimonious? Parsimonious, yeah. Huh? I'm gonna try to use that one, but that's because the because it's like a li- it's like a win, right? You get a win when you got the oh, deal. You think you got you the know? psychological win? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's that's definitely that could be it. Yeah. A little victory. Yeah, I think that yeah. is it because yeah, yeah. I know people like that too. Back to the book. Hope encourages men to endure and attempt everything in depriving them of it or in making it too distant. You deprive them of their very soul. Now, that immediately made me think of uh, Stalingrad when we were reading about Stalingrad mm-hmm. and the fact that the soldiers. When something would give them a glimmer of hope it would totally change their attitude yeah. like when they thought that the German troops were coming to rescue The the guys that were in Stalingrad in the pocket in Stalingrad. Yeah, they were all excited and they were you know happy and like yeah. He literally said like everyone's morale went up and then they find out they're not coming. It's just crushed. Yeah, yeah. crushed morale Yeah, we see that's the, based on hope. Yeah fully and the, you kind of see that in like in like like a workout for example like if you have a in football we'd have like conditioning right and sometimes they'd just be like hey we're just running sprints wind sprints they wouldn't say hey we got 10 wind sprints mm-hmm. it's not like that and after a while like guys are dying and you know not dying but you know we're getting tired right. so the sprints are a lot slower towards it but they say hey, two more finish hard for all of a sudden everybody can run fast there again you, you know, know you yeah. what i'm saying even though you're tired because you see that little light at they the end get of the done with that second's pretty cool i was kidding eight more <laughs> Yeah. I'm gonna do it. Yeah. <laughs> and then you watch the hope just go mm-hmm. again. Back to being slow. Back to the book. This is this is pretty heavy. Truly the only good officers are the poor gentlemen who have nothing but their sword and their cape. But it is essential that they should be able to live on their pay. The man who devotes himself to war should regard it as a religious order into which he enters. He should have nothing, no other home than his troop and should hold himself honored in his profession. So there you go. Go all in. Uh, Yeah, all in. And when people always ask me, especially when I was in about work-life balance and I'm like, hey, I'm not the guy to talk about yeah. I'm not the good person, especially when I was in the military. Yeah. Because this was me. You know, my number one priority, 100%, was the teams. And everything <laughs> else was just kind of, hey, you're, everyone else is along for the ride, but yeah. I know where I'm going. <laughs> so, the being that devoted to war and it has a power. It has a certain... It made, you know, if you got a guy that's thinking about it all the time, I think it was Jade. Jade and I were talking about something, and he said, the person who cares more wins. Yeah. And that's that's accurate. Yep. And I won a lot of stuff in my day just because I cared more. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to sleep. I'm not, I'm just going to be thinking about this. You're going to go home, and this weekend, you're going to go and 
do a family barbecue and you're gonna go play baseball with the kids and blah 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 and I was just like no I'm just gonna be doing this all weekend yeah. I'm gonna be working on this we're going I'm I got I'm, I care about this yeah nothing else matters mm-hmm. so that's a again is it healthy for work-life balance no it's not wor- healthy except for to say if you're that committed to your work, you're a committed person, then that means you're trying to take care of your family. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Am I reaching? Maybe. Yeah, I think you Okay, are. I'm reaching. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> you fine. know, marry a, a good, independent woman that doesn't need emotional support from you all the time so that yeah. she understands that. That was the big thing for me. I think my wife understood that it wasn't meant as an offensive thing. Yeah. Like, I have a job and... I really care about my job doesn't mean I don't care about you, but yeah. my job is right now and yeah. I need to do that Yeah, and even the work-life balance. Am I thing, just a bad husband? No, no because the work life No, bit. because there is no templated time allotted You know that you need to spend with these people or those people are work versus family. There's no like thing You know sometimes if you're like hey, I need to spend more time with my wife your wife's like bro go do leave yeah. me alone you know like we we spent the weekend together calm down you know go to work or whatever some people like that and it's a spectrum so work life balance is like it depends on your wife and you know in a, in a husband wife situation you know i suppose instead you. of instead of trying to take a life work life balance lesson out of this i think the most important thing to take out of this is is the level of commitment right if you yeah, really want to yeah. be successful yeah I'm not just talking about war. I'm talking about business. I'm talking about life. Yeah. If you really want to be successful, you gotta you gotta get after it. Man. Yeah, and you, you gotta, see you that. Gotta set the other things aside for now. Yeah, right. Just and, the way it is. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. All right. Back to the book. Training drill is necessary to make the soldier steady and skillful, although it does not warrant exclusive attention. Among all the elements of war, it is, it even is the one that deserves the least. If one accepts those which are dangerous, I tried to figure out what that meant. I just thought opium. <laughs> that was an opium yeah. hit right there. The last part. <laughs> the foundation of training depends. Oh, this is good. But but okay. So drill. If you know anything about the military, drill, especially back in those days, it was it really was a necessary thing because you had to function together as a team. And the way you do that, and we still do what's called close order drill in the military now. You've seen it go watch the US Marine Corps close order silent drill team they do all these really specific maneuvers and they have competitions in high schools between the ROTC classes where you know you're carrying the rifle you spin you do that all that stuff that's called drill yeah the reason it originated is because you needed to for two reasons number one you actually had to do those motions on the battlefield raise your rifle you know, load make ready aim fire and then the next rank will be doing the same thing you had to do it in a coordinated method mm. And the other the reason that they kept doing it according to my drill instructor in officer candidate school Gunnery sergeant United States Marine Corps oddly enough last name was seals That was his last name great guy layers. Yeah layers gunnery sergeant seals my drill instructor From the United States Marine Corps at officer candidate school He said the reason that you're learning this drill is because the reason that we do drill is because people need to Act instantly upon orders mm. so it, it drills into you a level of obedience mm. when you get told by the left flank march everyone goes yeah by the right flank march everyone goes mm. you know so it teaches you that hey I'm gonna go and that's what they used to use it for but they still use it now to so that people get used to the immediate obedience of orders now does that get contradicted by things that I talk about all the time on here about questioning orders and making sure you understand why you're doing it? yeah it does absolutely yeah. but there is a that's why that's what it exists for yeah yeah, and at least the capability still And exists, the capability you know? is there. Yeah. Yes, the capability is there. Back to the book. The foundation of training depends on the legs and not the arms. All the mystery of maneuvers and combat is in the legs. And it is to the legs that we should apply ourselves. Whoever claims otherwise is but a fool. And not only in the elements of what is called the profession of arms. So interestingly, Mm -hmm. your personal problem with people that talk about skipping leg day, Mm -hmm. (laughs) it goes back, (laughs) it goes back to here. Yeah, dang. The big guns, the big arms, useless. they didn't wanna help us in the the art of war, according to Sachs. In Hawaii they call that big for nothing. Actually big for nothing in Hawaii means like, I guess here they say all go no show, right? 
So that's kind of what having big arms and small legs kind of is as well, right? So now you're on board with that. Well, yeah, no, I never was <laughs> skipping legs day. You were the one teasing me, and I was wondering why is that so funny. But I guess yeah, that's, that's been why. funny it's since been day funny. one. It's a fool, because you look while. like a fool. Because you're a fool. That's it. That's yeah. the answer. Dang. Yep, it goes back. Yeah, it goes back a long time. So even back then, people were skipping leg day. Yeah, because they were fools. Yeah, fools. They're kind of focusing on the wrong thing, and it makes sense. Even yeah. like in those terms, it makes sense today. <laughs> Let me tell you something. The the amount like when I was in the team, so I was running training, and I, I still talk to guys, obviously. But if you think about what's going on, the train like people, to, people, you know, I say all the time, like all oh, seal training is not that hard, right? I say it all the time, like, the, but I'm talking about buds. I'm telling you, the advanced training that you go to, mm-hmm. the training that I used to run, it, it's it's freaking really hard. Yeah. It's really hard. You're in the desert. The desert, don't think of sand, think of rocks, think of jagged, uneven terrain, up and down hills. Then think about, you're on night vision, so it's at night. Think about you have, let's call it, about 80 pounds of gear on, just on average. That's like the average guy's got 80 pounds of gear on. You're going to get dropped off in the middle of the desert. Again, not the desert, but the rocky, what's it called, sub- I, I forget it's it's the rocky crazy terrain. It's hard to walk on in the daytime It's hard to walk on now. You're at, you're at night now You have night vision on which is great, but night vision is looking far away mm-hmm. and you can adjust one of your night vision Sides so you have two and you mm-hmm. can adjust one to far and one to close so you can see a little bit But still your peripheral vision isn't there mm-hmm. Your peripheral vision has gone because there's a tube in front of your head. Yeah, so you can't really see what's actually underneath your feet you can look down and then you can see it for a second, but you can't walk around looking yeah. down the whole time. You got to look at the guy in front of you. You got to look at the you, you, at your field of fire. So, as you're walking, you're making these micro adjustments all the time to adapt to your foot hitting the ground in some weird spot. And mm-hmm. so you get that, and then you have that weight on your back. And so mm-hmm. you get dropped off. Then you patrol ten kilometers. Ten kilometers, maybe what? What's that? That's six miles. So, you, so you're going six miles. Then you get six miles. You get to a target area. You get to the target area. You got to get eyes on the target area. You know where you get eyes on? You climb the biggest hill around at night, being as quiet as you can. You get to the top of that hill, you look at it, then you go and assault the target. Once you assault the target, guess what? You're for when you're assaulting the target, you're now like almost running. You're running through the thing at night. You're shooting machine guns. Guess what? Guys get hit. Guys go down. This is even in training. Guys are going down. Now you're going to carry them. Well, who are you going to carry them? Who's going to carry them? You are. Yeah. What are you gonna do? How are you gonna carry them? You're gonna there's only one way sure okay There's stretchers there's you can you can bring litters and we certainly bring litters in the field But they take some time to set up and you got to get organized to make that happen What's gonna happen initially is somebody is gonna sling that dude on his back and by the way that person that weighs 200 pounds has 80 pounds of gear with him. So now we're talking 280 pounds mm. You're gonna put that person on your back and you're gonna walk at a high rate of speed mm. through this rocky terrain And you're gonna do that for another two to three miles to get out it's hard that kind of training and by the way this whole time there's no like who ya there's no mm-hmm. hey come on there's no there's no there's no you don't even speak mm-hmm. it's just in silence yeah. you're just going and everyone knows what you have to do yeah and so that's why you got to do leg day yeah not skip leg day cuz your legs it's, it's your legs got to carry that weight yeah going back to the book to return to the march about which everyone bothers themselves to the death but will never reach a conclusion unless I reveal a secret. So he's got a secret about maneuvering troops. This is this I found this interesting. Some wish to march slowly, others would march fast, but what about the troops whom no one knows how to make march fast or slowly as they desire or is necessary and who require an officer at every corner to make them turn like some snails and others are running and this is to advance this column which is always trailing. It is a comedy to see even a battalion to commence movement. So what he's talking about is if you're moving with a unit and this happens with a even happens with a platoon but it definitely happens when you get bigger elements you know a, a company sized element where you've got a, a hundred people that are moving it's it's uh, the caterpillar effect right like the front yeah. moves and then it takes a little while for the people to catch up and then when they stop everyone bumps into yeah. them and you end up with this this thing that's really really hard to move caterpillar effect. 
Yeah, yeah, and this is so. This is how he says. This is his big secret. Shall I say it? This great word, which comprises all the mystery of the art, and which n- which will no doubt be seen as ridiculous, have them march in cadence. <laughs> That is why these musical marches were instituted, and that is why one beats the drum. It is this which no one knows and no one has perceived. With this, you can march fast or slow as you wish. The tail will not lose the distance. All your soldiers will start on the same foot. The changes of direction will be made together with speed and grace, and the legs of your soldiers will not get tangled up. You will not be forced to halt after each turn in order to start off on the same foot. Your soldiers will not exhaust themselves a quarter as much as at present. Now, what I thought was interesting about that is it's an obvious answer, right? And now clearly you're not going to do that in the modern day military in the field. You're not going to play music so guys can march to it so you can stay in cadence. But I think it's more important to that sometimes we lose things. We lose methods. They're in front of our face, but we don't understand why they were there. Mm -hmm. And I'll I'll tell you, I was thinking of a story. I was running training. And one of my guys who was uh, one of the assistant platoon commanders in TU Bruiser, mm-hmm. great guy, hard to choke, real long neck. Sure. You know, you can make it happen, but you, you're going to work for it. <laughs> real, is it? Well, if some people you might think long neck, easy to choke, right? Yeah. No, this was his neck was so long, and he was strong too. Lo- he is strong, long and strong neck, so his neck would like bend in a guillotine. Oh, and he could keep it. breathing. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. that long. Gotcha. It was a long neck. <laughs> so, anyways, we were out at this training site, and we were doing. He was his. It was his platoon. Now he was a platoon commander, and they were coming over the beach, and meaning swimming over the beach. And then you go do live fire, and this really. So so they're doing it. They're doing iterations, and he's coming up on the beach, and his weapons. You know, you, you when you get to the beach, your weapon's wet, sandy, because you go through the surf and it's all jacked up. And then you try and shoot your gun; it doesn't work. You got to clean it, and it's just a pain. Mm. And he says, "Hey, man, do you have any like suggestions on how to get my weapon firing once I get over the beach?" Mm. And I go, "Yeah, man, don't let it get wet." And he, and he was kind of, you know, like really. And I said, "Yeah, don't let it get wet," because when you're swimming in, you've got a rucksack. Mm. But the rucksack isn't it's it's waterproofed so it kind of floats mm. and so you can put your weapon on top of your rucksack mm. And you can kind of keep it dry there and when you're just swimming you just keep now You're not going to keep your weapon completely dry. It's not going to happen. Mm. It's going to get wet but The attitude if you have the attitude that you're trying to keep it dry yeah. you'll ch- keep it 90% more dry than you would otherwise and most important when you come through the beach when you come through the waves You won't let it get the sand in it mm, yeah. And he kind of looked at me with you know a funny face of like are you serious? Like, how can you keep it dry and I said keep it dry yeah. Next time I'm watching him we're on night vision I'm watching him and sure enough like his his weapon barely went in the water and He yeah. got up on the beach and boom it works guess yeah. what? It's an obvious answer but Sometimes people we know we just need to have somebody share the obvious answer with us so that we can execute. Yeah Yeah, that makes sense that Yeah, marching makes sense. thing is that then that's crazy. I didn't know that that marching thing like that, yeah. that's why you march to cadence or whatever yeah. It's like so yeah. that caterpillar effect especially with like a shuts lot of people down the Actually, effect, that's sure. why there's traffic by the way. Yes, same that's thing. why the uh, traffic exists because of that little yeah, effect That's it's exactly like, true. You know one guy, one guy going the reaction time and You all know the stuff. other funny thing he said in here is he says go watch people dance you see a soldier dance all night But he can't march for more than an hour without <laughs> being tired. Why is that give him some music <laughs> kind of funny? <laughs> Sure. I didn't want to say that part, but because yeah. then people started asking me about dancing. Yeah, yeah. They want to see you dance. No, no talk of dance on the podcast. Back to the book. If the previous war had lasted a little longer, indubitably everyone would have fought hand to hand. This was because the abusive firing began to be appreciated. It causes more noise than harm, and those who depend on it are always beaten. So, what any. I encapsulated a lot of stuff. What he was talking about was how everyone was so excited to shoot their rifles. Mm. And at this time period, the rifles weren't all that accurate. And so it was a bunch of noise, but they weren't always that effective. Mm. And it would be better. And by the way, when you when you had to shoot your rifle, you had to stop. 
So now instead of charging, we're stopping, we're loading, we're firing, the other rank is firing, and if the other people are moving on you, well, they're gonna get close enough and they're gonna have no, now momentum and they're gonna overtake you or they're gonna overpower you. Mm-hmm. With what? With bayonets and hand-to-hand combat. Mm-hmm. So what I thought was interesting about this is he's saying, hey, all this noise, it's basically noisemakers. Mm-hmm. For, for all practical purposes, they're noisemakers. And he's saying, and what I was thinking was, it's this goes to be, this to me is very similar to people that yell a lot. Right, you yell a lot. You someone that's loud, someone that's always talking. Someone, and he says that people who depend on that are always beaten. Mm. And I thought to myself, that's a very accurate statement. Mm-hmm. Very accurate statement. So don't just talk for the purpose of talking. Yeah. Right? Don't. If you don't have anything to say, that's fine. Mm-hmm. Be quiet. Don't say anything. It's actually good. Yep. Here he talks about the Roman legions. The Romans vanquished all nations by their discipline. No big deal. No. They meditated on war const- continually, and they always renounced old customs whenever they found better. In this respect, they differed from the Gauls, whom they defeated during several centuries without the latter thinking of correcting their errors. So m- this is clearly the Romans. Okay, we know discipline's important. Talk about it all the time. But more important, lesson here is they always renounced old customs whenever they found better boom renounce the old customs when you find better ones this is something you need to do in your life something you need to do in your business it's something you need to do on the mat and I'll tell you going back to the other part sometimes there's things in jujitsu that you find a better way and they work for a while and then you go back to the old way and it works because people are expecting the new way. Mm. Dean talks, Dean will say, this is an, a new old move. Yeah, yeah, he just said that the other day. Yeah, this it's is good. a new old move. What, it, it worked 10 years ago. It wouldn't work five years ago because everyone knew it. Now it'll work again because everyone forgot it. Yeah, and that's kind <laughs> like of- Like everyone old. forgot why, why we use cadence, why we use music. Yeah. We forgot why, we don't know how to march now. Yeah, yeah it's, and it's essentially the same reason why the new move will work because people are unfamiliar yeah. you know because you know you you have a certain attack or whatever and then the more people know about that attack the harder it is to to be successful with it and then you find some new variation that not, that not everyone um knows that's i mean the footlock game kind of was like that too for a little bit mm-hmm. uh, and then after a while all those fundamentals which were essentially the early version of the of the move yeah or whatever um that's still there, but we got this new unrevealed move that's getting everyone because they're unfamiliar. It's like a su- um, surprise kind of, yeah. but they're just unfamiliar. And then now everyone gets familiar with it, and it's like, cool, it's an okay move. Yeah. But the real good one was that original, the OG one. Yeah. But everyone just got used to it. Yeah, and then w- once everyone gets used to the new one, they'll yeah. forget about the old one. Yeah. For sure. Correct and improve. Renounce your old customs whenever you find better. Now he's talking a little bit about peacetime and how you maintain your army during peacetime. He says, as for the cavalry, it should never be touched, meaning you shouldn't you shouldn't get rid of any cavalry people. The old troopers and the old horses are the good, and the recruits of either are absolutely useless. It is a burden and it is an expense, but is indispensable. In regard to the infantry, as long as there are a few old heads, you can do what you want with the tails. So, a horseman is, you, you got the skilled horse and you got the skilled horse rider, and he says in this, I don't know if I'll read it, but he says also in here, it takes 10 years to make a good a good cavalryman. A good guy that's really good on the horse with a really good horse takes 10 years to make them. So you can't just get rid of that person. Mm. But an infantryman, if you got some good, this is what I liked about it, if you've got good leadership, Good leadership with infantrymen. Hey, man, there's some fundamental skills you're going to need to learn, and we'll be ready to rock and roll, mm-hmm. which is which is awesome. Mm-hmm. Good leadership goes a long way. I mean, and again, you have to have. It takes a lot. It takes the same amount of time to make a good infantry leader, because those are skills that take a long time to develop to become a leader in, uh, of infantry troops. Mm-hmm. But your basic combat riflemen, you can make them pretty quick. Not like it's a, it's a hell of a lot easier than making someone that can ride a horse. Yeah. 
So, and then your leadership's going to go a long way. Back to the book. In attacking infantry, the two rear ranks are to lower their pikes. In this position, the pikes will extend from six to seven feet ahead of the front rank. The front ranks being sheltered in such a manner will, I am sure, aim with more confidence than if they had nothing in front of them. Besides this, the third rank can ward off blows and defend the first rank, which will do which it will do much better since it is covered by the first two ranks. The second rank, which is armed with muskets, can fire and defend the man in front of him in the first rank without the latter being obliged to stoop. This avoids a serious disadvantage which is incurred in kneeling, a dangerous movement, because men who are afraid prefer this position. They cannot be made to get up when wanted and is always necessary to halt to kneel. According to my formation, all the men are covered each by each other with reciprocal confidence. The front presents a forest of spears. Their appearance is formidable and gives confidence to your own troops because they feel its power. So a couple interesting things there. Obviously, it's a cover-move situation, and, and, and we're going to work that out. But I thought beyond that, it was interesting that if, you gotta, if you're going to take a knee, well, there's two things that are happening. Number one, you have to stop to take a knee. We're not advancing on our knees. Mm-hmm. And number two, people that are afraid they want to be down there. And it's going to be hard to get them back up, so don't even let them get down there. Yeah. Keep that momentum going. We're looking to keep that momentum going. Back to the book. Those who imagine that, and I think I state this every time, usually around this point in the podcast, I'm skipping a lot of the book. Sure. It's just the way it is. Yep. We're not going to read the whole <clears throat> book on here. You have to order it yourself if you want to hear every secret of sax. Those who imagine that the Roman legions were composed of Romans from Rome are very much deceived. They came from all the nations in the world, but their composition, their discipline, and their methods of fighting were better than all those other nations. This is why they conquered them all. Neither were they conquered in their turn until this discipline had degenerated among the Romans. Discipline will get you a long way, and lack of discipline will get you killed. Disintegrated. It disintegrated. Talking more about cavalry here. The cavalry should be active and mounted on horses inured to fatigue. It should be encumbered with as little baggage as possible, and above all, should not make the common error of having fat horses. If they could see an enemy every day, it would only be better, for this would soon put them in condition to attempt anything. It is certain that the power of, power of cavalry is not understood. Why? Because of, we have love for fat horses. I had a regiment of German cavalry in Poland with which I marched more than 1,500 leagues in 18 months. I maintain that this regiment was more fit for service at the end of this time than another supplied with fat horses. But to reach this condition, they must be gradually accustomed to hardship and hardened by hunts and violent exercise. This will maintain their health and increase their endurance. Likewise, it will make cavalrymen of the troopers and give them a martial bearing. So... You got to train hard. I just read all that to basically say you got to train hard. Mm. You want to be ready to fight, you got to train how you fight. Mm. And don't get on a fat horse, apparently. I'll have to ask my wife about that one. She knows more about horses than me or Leif. Sure. Leif knows about horses. He's from Texas. Everyone from Texas rides a horse. Yeah. Is that the image? Yes. When I, go, when I would go overseas, people thought everyone in America is basically carrying a pistol on them at all times. <laughs> that's, that's, the, <laughs> that's the image that people have of America. I like that image for people to have of America, too. I mean, I'm sure some people don't like that image, but yeah, you know, be nice when you come here. You can want to come and visit. That's cool. We, we welcome visitors. Just be nice. Everyone's, everyone's carrying a 45 in their back pocket. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can you carry a forty-five in your back pocket? You could. I mean, would it recommend it? No, wouldn't recommend it. You get a holster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So back, but, that's more but, of an expression. No, no, it's not even an expression. But if you go to another country, they think that we've just got them in our back pocket. Yeah, you yeah. Know, yeah. Like you carry your wallet and a forty-five. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> Next <Sure>. question. <laughs> yeah. You see where I'm coming from here? Yes. That's how we roll. This is America. I do not back to the book. I do not know why armor has been laid aside for the for nothing is either so useful or ornamental. If it be considered how many troopers perish by the sword and how many are, are how many many are dangerously wounded by random and weak shots, accident accidents against which armor guarantees protection, one cannot avoid acknowledging the benefits of it. It is nothing but indolence and relaxation of discipline that caused it to be laid aside. It is wearisome to carry a cuirass and a trail pike and trail a pike half a century to use it a single day. But as soon as discipline is neglected in a nation, as soon as comfort becomes an aim, it needs no inspiration to foretell that ruin is near. The Romans conquered all peoples by their discipline. In the measure that it became corrupted, their success decreased. When the Emperor Gratian permitted the legions to quit their cuirasses and helmets because the soldiers complained they were too heavy, all was lost. The barbarians whom they had defeated during so many centuries vanquished them. So that's all. That's all. People stop wearing their armor because mm-hmm. it's heavy. Yep. Body armor's heavy. Yeah. Yep. Like helmet. The, your helmet's heavy. Yeah. You want that a little tiny helmet? You want the oh, let's take out the back plate of our body armor. Oh, probably won't get shot there. No. Yeah. Was it? Who was? Ta- was that Jody ta- talking about that? Like, oh, I didn't think Jody. Yeah. Though those guys going into that, they were they were going into an operation. They didn't wear their body armor. Yeah, because they were like, dang. It's, yeah, we're not gonna happen. Oh, plus we plus we we're, we light and maneuverable. Mm. That's the thing you say. Yeah. Yeah. It's like skipping your workout and saying, "Well, I need to rest to like recover yeah. today." Yeah. It's kind of the same thing. Very similar. Yes, yeah. I'll give you that one. Skipping workouts every one. day. Yeah, he obviously. Um, as soon as discipline is neglected in a nation, guess what? It's the same thing with your personal life. Obviously. Obviously. Back to the book. The troopers should have a goatskin bottle like those used in hot countries instead of a canteen or a barrel to hold liquors in. <laughs> this with his linen stockings, cap, a cord, and a few other necessities is to be put in the bottom of a sack which will roll up with his coat and can be fastened with two straps behind him. This will reduce the monstrous load which is now carried by the cavalry. It is necessary from time to time to inspect the baggage and force the men to throw away useless items. I have frequently done it. One can hardly imagine all the trash they carry with them year after year. The poor horse has to carry everything. It is no exaggeration to say that I have filled 20 wagons with useless rubbish, which I have found in the review of a single regiment. (laughs) So people will tend to carry a lot. Mm -hmm. A lot that they don't need. And that weighs down on you. I, I think I've talked about this before, but uh, the back in Burke in the day, we had these winter platoons, which I never did one. Uh, out on the East Coast, they had these winter platoons. And you're going long distance on cross country skis, right? You know mm-hmm. what those are? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Long, long distances. And that is a very, it's, you're basically like running a marathon. Yeah. And so the guys were super anal about the weight that they carried. Yeah. So, like, they would. You know how the backpack a backpack has you know a strap that you pull you pull to tighten it they right. get it to the port where it was supposed to be give it a little bit of slack and then cut the re- cut the rest off and sew it so they don't want to carry that little extra four inches of nylon yeah not gonna do it Dang. they had every piece of gear that they had would be like that yeah the, that the, the winter warriors a team too Burkina dude. here's an interesting thing in passing through water the horses must never be allowed to drink a man who halts to water his horse will stop a whole army. When this happens, the officers should hasten to the spot, and instead of fruitless reprimands and ill-timed mercy, they should instantly chastise the offender. Nothing is of such importance for the preservation of the cavalry. Otherwise, 
the affection the men they have for their horses will have them halting little or much and then it is impossible for them to recover their ranks without galloping discipline people get that little affection for their for not just you know I wasn't thinking horses there I was thinking about like being on a long patrol or in the workplace you you want your team to go mm-hmm. and every time you you grant that little bit of mercy right mm-hmm. am I saying be merciless slave, slave driver no but when mm-hmm. you do it you start to develop that trend and now it throws other things off and sometimes you just got to be hey no be quiet and execute yeah we gotta go gotta go in time of peace and in winter quarters in time of war their horses should be kept in condition by violent exercise or runs at least three times a week I like this idea of violent exercise I'm gonna start doing more violent exercising violent exercise. yeah sure. that's good sure. I like violent exercising the same severe usage is also proper for the heavy cavalry charge at those times it is in the field it is only in the field that they must be managed carefully to keep them in flesh and the squadrons complete and strong and this is interesting the best chance of teaching them to stand fire is when the infantry is practicing they should advance on the fire and walk and be kept calm accustoming accustoming them to go closer and closer they should never be beaten but stroked and encouraged encouraged in the space of a month they will be so accustomed to it that they will even put their nose on the muzzle of the muskets without any fright or surprise then they are all right nevertheless they should not be allowed to approach too close for once they get burned you will not be able to bring them near again this ordeal must be reserved for the day of battle that was good that to me reminded me of what Jordan Peterson was talking about and where the warrior kid how you slowly yeah. inoculate people you don't throw them into the you don't bring them right up to the firing line and start shooting the guns and let them get freaked out horribly yeah. you bring them a little distance you let them listen from afar and then you yeah. bring them a little bit closer and then next thing you know they're good to go they're standing in line what do you yeah. call that what did Jordan Peterson call that I exposure a, yeah gradual es- exposure therapy or exposure or yeah like graduated exposure therapy something it's something, something yeah it was something like that, something like that. <clears throat> cover and move a little bit of that I am convinced every unit that is not supported is a defeated organization infantry should always be supported by cavalry and cavalry by infantry cover and move mm-hmm. work together support here's a little note back to the book the general or commander-in-chief of an army should have a standard to be carried ahead of him as a mark of his rank so he's talking about flags Mm. this is this also has a purpose anyone searching for him will know instantly where to find him especially in battle and the troops seeing the standard will know that the general is observing them so one thing we did and they do in the military is they you when you're giving your brief on how the mission's gonna go you brief location of leadership mm-hmm. so they say okay as we're gonna take down these eight buildings I'll be here in this building uh, on the top floor mm-hmm. boom so if you need me know where to come find me if something happens hey where's this platoon leader gonna be yep once we get our targets here I'm gonna come over here I'm gonna stand on the backside where the breach took place if you need me that's where I'll be so everyone so you know where everyone is and is he talking about like having a, a standard that's like a like a symbol it's a flag yeah yeah right? so an actual yeah. flag Yep, so, an actual flag. So this you guys at. wouldn't really. No, we or, didn't do that because we isn't there like a thing? Yes, that's saying like, hey, you don't want like I what was it? I want to say saving private Ryan. It's like don't salute. Yeah, 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 me yeah or whatever. Because no, I don't want the enemy no. to see where. Yep. Yeah, you did. You definitely don't want uh, to mark your position. Right. Like, like yeah, well, these like guys the are doing. Is, and as a matter of fact. And I'm trying to think of what book we recently did where he was talking about, like, yeah, if you're seen running around, if you're a radio man or you're seen running around giving direction, you, you're going to get shot. Yeah. Yeah, the officer, that I was think like it was, a I think Vietnam it, I think it was, uh, I think it was the Battle of I Drang. Mm. But, yeah, they're talking about that. Mm. Oh, yeah, it definitely was the Battle of I Drang. Mm. It was because when they were leaving, they said, like, within within minutes, the leaders had been killed. Yeah, and The radio yeah. man had been killed. The ones that were still with their elements. So yeah, that's not something you want to do. But what we would do is brief where we were going to be so that everyone on the team knew based on a terrain feature. Yeah. You know, hey, here's this here's this building or here's this knoll of this 
mountain or here's this intersection, this road. That's where I'll be. That's where I'm. That's where I'm planning to be. So now people know where you are. Yeah, makes sense. And I mean, he had an additional thing there when when he said, um, "So that you know, the general's watching," yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, I guess that wouldn't really apply to your situation, no, no, right? No. Yeah, it wouldn't but, apply. Although, like in the military, when the general is visiting and is a two star general, they raise a two star flag. Yeah, so everyone knows same thing. There. there it is. Yeah, yeah. Dang. So okay. So I guess yeah, you're right. So it'll be real circumstantial, like during a war. Yeah, you're not battle, gonna be in a combat you're situation. You're not doing that. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Yes. Now he talks about the companies, and again, he calls them sentries, mm. which is basically a company sized element of around 100 guys. Mm. And he's saying that they should have their own little symbols as well and their own standards. Back to the book. If the standards are distinguished by their different colors, the actions of every century will be conspicuous. This will create the greatest emulation because both officers and soldiers will know that they are seen and that their countenance, conduct, and behavior are not ignored by the rest of the army. The men as well as the officers will tell of it. In the field and in garrison, their exploits will be constant the constant subject of conversation. I, I thought that was kind of a cool idea. You know, if you're if you're flying the flag, then people are watching you, and so you better act. You better come correct. You better represent. Yeah, you better represent. Yeah, actually, I like come correct. That's yeah. better. Come correct. <laughs> <laughs> Back to the book. After the organization of military troops, military discipline is the first matter that presents itself. It is the soul of armies. Hmm. That has such a nice ring to it. It's the soul of the individual as well, but I suppose we'll talk about that later. Back to the book. If it is not established with wisdom and maintained with unshakable resolution, you will have no soldiers. Regiments and armies will be only contemptible armed mobs more dangerous to their own country than the enemy It is a false idea that discipline subordination and slavish obedience debase courage It has always been noted that it is with those armies in which the severest discipline is enforced that the greatest deeds are performed Many generals believe that they have done everything as soon as they have issued orders and that they are and they order a great deal because they find many abuses. So he's saying there like when a general feels like he's talking about a bad general when a general feels like they've done everything as soon as they've given their order. And since that's what they do, they give all kinds of orders. I'm going to order you to do this. I'm going to order you to do that. I'm going to order you to do something else. Here's what he says. This is a false principle. Proceeding in this fashion, they will never reestablish discipline in an army in which it has been lost or weakened. Few orders are best, but they should be followed up with care. Negligence should be punished without partiality and without distinction of rank or birth. Otherwise, you will make yourself hated. One can be exact and just and be loved at the same time as feared. Severity must be accompanied with kindness, but this should not have the appearance of pretense, but of goodness. And this is just a little note I thought everyone should know. Whippings need not be severe. (laughs) The more moderate they are, the more quickly will abuses be remedied since all the world will join in ending them. So even when you're whipping your people, you know, Be a little bit more (laughs) judicious. We have a, this is, this is good too. We have a a pernicious custom in France of always punishing with death. A soldier caught pillaging is hung. The result, now what do you think the result of that would be that he's going to say? I'm quizzing you. Uh, What's your uh, guess? If you hang somebody? If you, if you um, are pillaging, caught pillaging, you're going to get hung. Okay. What, what do you think the what do you think the happens because of that happens to who what do you think do, they, do well, they, why should we not hang people for pillaging do you think, think there's a lot of pillaging going on if you get caught pillaging they hang you or I your see. fellow soldiers do you think they pillage I say no okay you're wrong the result is that no one arrests him because they do not want to cause the death of a poor devil who is only trying to live. If instead we were only turned him over to the guard to be put in chains and condemned to bread and water for one, two, or three months, 
or put to work in in at any of the labors that always have to be done in any army and then they were sent to his regiment before a battle or when the general wished everyone would agree with this punishment and the officers of the patrols would arrest them by the hundreds soon there would be no pillaging because everyone would join in putting it under control so Dang, that makes yeah, sense yeah it is exactly yeah. the reason i asked you that which i don't normally do is because i thought the same thing i was yeah. like oh what's where's he going with this oh yeah and it's obvious once you think about yeah. it you're not going to report one of your guys for stealing something if the punishment was death bro you know what that is that's like that's like small picture versus big picture mm-hmm. small pre- small picture is like yeah cuz cuz you just look at it as yourself right you get your bubble in your head you're like i wouldn't pillage if the if the if it was death yeah. i wouldn't pillage and that's how you're looking at it but no big picture is like it doesn't work. It, it, apply that to everyone apply it to the whole community exactly right if you tell on this guy pillaging you just sentenced him to death yep. if you tell on him maybe you turn him in or whatever that's what you did good point and it's a, i just remembered somebody pointed out to me you remember rifleman harris and it starts off when my rifleman Harris has to execute a guy and I said I I said on the podcast hey this guy's getting executed basically for desertion and being drunk Mm -hmm. what I didn't realize is if somebody sent me an email or a social media message they said hey the reason that guy was getting executed was because he had taken the money for like 16 enlistments Mm -hmm. and kept disappearing so when you you get a signing bonus Mm -hmm. hey here's a here's it's probably nothing, but it, you know, here's here's ten quid or pound sterling or whatever. Here's ten pounds sterling. Oh, you're joining the army. Cool. Here's ten, and you, then you take that money, go get drunk and get crazy, mm. and then you do it again, and then you do it again in a different area because they have no internet, they have no way of knowing that this is the guy. When yeah. they finally catch him, he's getting sentenced to death. Now, do I think he should get sentenced to death even for that? Not really, yeah. but he was doing something more severe than what I had mentioned on the yeah. podcast. So I, I just wanted to, while I'm thinking about that, set the record straight. But the the main point here for me is the secondary effects, right? You think you're gonna have the primary effect is oh, if we do this, no one's gonna if we're gonna kill you if you get caught pillaging, no one's gonna no one's gonna pillage anymore. Yeah. No, actually, no one's gonna report it anymore because your punishment is too yeah strong. Damn, this is clever. also how this is also how and why when people think that oh, if someone's in the military, the soldiers just do what they're told. Wrong. Yeah. The soldiers actually, they're, they're secondary effects. Mm-hmm. Oh, you're going to kill the guys? No, well, we're not going to report it then. Yeah. So there's there's secondary effects, even though they've been ordered to do that, and they're soldiers, and they have discipline, they've been trained. He's bragging about discipline all the time. Guess what? They don't follow that order because the order sucks. Yeah. And that's what we got to remember, not just about the military, but about business too. Mm-hmm. You give people dumb orders, or you give people things that don't make sense, they're not really going to execute it the way you'd want them to. And I'll tell you something else. You don't want them to execute that way because if they got hundreds of people pillaging and you now end up murdering hundreds of own your own people, you're affecting your own army. You're going to get deserters. Yeah. I'm going to work in an army like that. The same thing with the business. Yeah. You start laying out severe punish- punishment that doesn't make sense, isn't reciprocal to the crime that was committed. Yeah. I mean, you pillage. Think about what pillaging is. I took some bread from the store. Mm-hmm. Cool. We're going to shoot you in the head. <laughs> Dang. The punishment did not fit the crime. Yeah. In that case, all right. He he he's talking about where to build where to build tactical positions, and he says, and this is just the same thing he said earlier about people, but he's talking about basically talking about terrain now. Nature is infinitely stronger than the works of man. Why not profit from it? Meaning, use a river, use a hill, use use terrain to build your defensive positions. Don't just use a shovel. Yeah. <laughs> Same thing that he talked about earlier with with human beings. Now, another piece. Many persons believe that it is advantageous to take the field early. And this is coming right back. Sun Tzu, Art of War. Be there first. Yeah. Sachs maybe doesn't agree with that a little bit here. They are right when it is a question of seizing an important post. Otherwise, it seems to me that there is no need to hasten and that one should remain in winter quarters longer than usual. So he goes on to talk. Winter quarters means you're you're going to go out in the field. Well, we're going to go out in the field now. Mm. And we're going to be cold, wet, and miserable for the next three days while we wait for the enemy to show up. And now they show up fresh. Mm. Who's going to do better in the battle? Yeah. So just to think about, I used to say, the, the military used to say all the time, you know, you got to be forward-leaning. Mm-hmm. Have you ever heard that expression? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you got to be forward-leaning. And... I would say let's not be so forward leaning that we're in the leaning rest. The leaning rest is the push up position, yeah. which they would leave you in for long periods of time 
in yeah. a lot of different training situations. So sometimes you get so proactive, you get so leaning forward, or forward leaning, that you're in the leaning rest and you're wasting energy just trying to be yeah. all prepared. Like, yeah. no. Like, you'd see some guys warm up. You do such a good warm up that you're tired. Yeah. <laughs> you, you went so far forward leaning that you're in the leaning rest. Yeah. And then the other thing is to not warm up at all. Now you're not ready. So you yeah. got to find, well, you got, that's a dichotomy of leadership. You got to find a balance between those two. Yeah. Another good point here. Back to the book. It is absolutely necessary to accustom soldiers to labor. If we examine Roman history, we find we shall find that Republic looked on ease and indolence as the most formidable enemies. The consuls prepared their legions for battle by rendering them indefatigable. Rather than have them idle, they employed them on unnecessary works. Continual exercise makes good soldiers because it qualifies them for military duties. By being habituated to pain, they insensibly learn to despise danger. The transition from fatigue to rest enervates them, meaning weakens them. They compare one state with another, and idleness, that predominant passion of mankind, gains ascendancy over them. They then murmur at every trifling inconvenience, and their souls soften in their emasculated bodies. <laughs> yeah, so what he's saying is, people get used to the soft ways. People get used to the easy life. And if you let them get used to it, like you, you, when you want to do something hard, when it's time to do something hard, you're not ready for it. Yep. Every minute that Charlie's out in the bush getting stronger, every time I'm, every day, night I'm spending in this hotel, it's an apocalypse now. Every night I'm sitting in this hotel getting softer every night, Charlie's out in the bush getting stronger. That's what he's talking about here. Yep. That's what he's talking about. But now, do I agree with having people do unnecessary works? No, I don't because people see right through that and it just you're just being stupid and taking they're gonna see that they're gonna say why are we doing this <clears throat> dig the hole fill it back up dig the hole fill it back up no don't do that but you know what we're gonna do a training exercise we do a training exercise we're gonna get stronger we're gonna get you know, we're gonna dig a hole we're gonna put you know set it up for a perimeter then we're gonna move to another situation it is if we have to back away mm. or or collapse our perimeter because when you collapse a perimeter you got to fill that hole back in otherwise when the enemy comes attack you they use it yeah so you got to fill that hole back in so let's run a real drill yeah and by the way, let's make it into a little contest and see how fast we can dig in. And then once we get it dug in, we're going to set up. We're going to see how fast we can collapse it, get it filled back in. We're doing it. And at the end of it, we're going to give out some, you know, some prizes and have a beer. Yeah. Right? <laughs> That's a good tactic, by the way, like to make a, um, whether it be a game or oh, yeah. ba- basically make it. Yeah, ga- you totally Where's gamify. Jay Charles? Gamify. Yeah. Jay Charles wants to gamify. Gamification. Gamification. The, uh, like if you're uh, moving, you know, you know when you're moving yeah. your house or whatever. Yeah. And um, how fast can I get this stuff packed up? Yeah, or let me use it as a little workout, little Metcon. Okay. We got to move the, all these boxes upstairs, two floors, whatever. Yep. You know, let me use it as a workout. It kind of makes it more enjoyable it as well. Does. But at the same time, you get the results of a, of a little workout right there. Here, let me ask you this about that. When you said you, you didn't agree with the, the unnecessary unnecessary work. Mm-hmm. So what about um, like push-ups as punishment, for example, or, ca- or exercise? That's an interesting one because I think... I think like with kids, if you make burpees a punishment, they don't like they don't burpees. Like them. Yeah. If you make it a reward, they like them, and you're that better exactly off. Exactly right. Yeah, I agree. I do that, by the way. Yeah, that's good. You make uh, it a reward. Yeah, you like allow, allow. only the cool people do burpees. Yeah. That's what it is. they see. Dad doing burpees. Dad doing you know these whatever exercises. Yeah. Whatever. Only cool people do it. I, I kind of push hard on that too, but it's unfair. But no, the the question is though, in the military. In the military, yeah, not kids. <laughs> no, calisthenics are definitely punishment in the military. Yeah, straight up. And it's not until you transition out of the boot camp scenarios that you get away from that. Now, in the SEAL teams, like they don't, you don't do calisthenics as punishment. I will say that if you mess up, like for instance, when I was running training, if the guys p- performed poorly. They were going to have more downed men. Again, this is a training. I'm talking about fake downed men, but they're going to have more men that couldn't walk. That's more men that have to be carried. Mm-hmm. That's punishment in its own That's right. That's a punishment. That's okay. a punishment. If you, when I was running a communications course, when I was a younger enlisted SEAL, 
if you missed a communications window, you had to walk a longer distance. Mm-hmm. If you missed multiple, you're going to have to walk tragic <laughs> distances. And, but that, that wasn't just a natural result of you missing. Missing. It was, you, did you impose that? Punishment? It was imposed. Okay. Yes, gotcha. it was imposed, and they knew it was imposed. Yeah. Okay. So, and and so yeah, you. you yeah, if you miss in the SEAL teams, if you miss the extraction point with a boat's coming to pick you up after a dive, mm-hmm. well, now you got to swim to the new exo- yeah. new pickup point. Guess what? The new pickup point isn't close. Yeah, because you've compromised now. You're above the surface. You need to get away. Yeah, and so that means you got to swim an extra. You know, maybe it's an extra hour of surface Dang. swimming with a rig on, yeah. which is not fun. By the no, way, no, it doesn't sound fun. Yeah, because mm-hmm. you can't. You're you're not just. You're not just having fun, right? <laughs> it's called turtle no, backing. You know. You're laying on your back because it's really awkward. It's 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 comfortable to dive with our dive rig. We have a dive rig that's it's called a rebreather, and yeah. it goes on your chest, and it's small. It's not it's not tiny. It's closed circuit. It's closed circuit. Yeah, look at you, <laughs> look at you, big time. <laughs> so it's a closed circuit dive rig, but when it runs out, you can't doesn't work anymore. Yeah. So you have to swim. And we do something called turtle back generally, which is basically you're laying on your back and you're just finning and it takes a long time to move very far and it's not comfortable. So the punishment is in training, if you miss your extraction point, that's fine. You just gotta swim to the alternate extraction point. Sure. The alternate extraction point is not gonna be close by. Yeah. Because you screwed up. Yeah. Same thing with if you miss your helicopter extraction mm-hmm. because you took too long on target and you got bogged down and it took you a long time to move all these down people. That's, I mean, it happens. We understand that. Yeah. But now you have to walk to the secondary extraction point, which happens to be six kilometers up a hill. Yeah. <laughs> See, but that's, to, to me, and this is me thinking, whatever, 10 seconds about it, that seems like that makes perfect sense. In fact, that seems like a cool little strategy because in real life, that's how it works. You miss the yeah. bus, you, dr- you ride the bus to school. You miss the bus, you're walking to school or riding your bike, whatever. It's kind of that thing. That's that's how life deals it to you a lot of the time, like these types of things, yeah. like what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. But let's say, hey, you, you know, your shoes aren't shined or whatever. Mm-hmm. I don't know. They aren't shined. Give me 50 push-ups. Yeah, no, they or, don't do that. Well, know, oh, well, they don't do it in the SEAL teams. They yeah. definitely do it in the Army. They definitely do it in the Rangers. The Rangers, yeah. they're, they're dropping down all the time. Right, right, right. And, but no, we don't do that. In the so that's things. the question, though. Do you do you agree with that, or, or do you even think about that kind of stuff? I don't think about that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I think being, I, I would say that I that I would not do it yeah. when I was in a military leadership position, just because I would rather. I don't know. Yeah, it's weird. It feels like it, like just uh, like you're. Like it makes sense when I know that the army runs it that way. It makes sense. And and by the way, when the army does it, and I I shouldn't even say anything else about the way the army does it because I'm not, I don't know exactly how they implement that strategy. So next time we have Tim Kennedy on, we'll get him to give us a full debrief on that. We'll get another another uh, ranger on here to to give us a full debrief on that. Here's something. So I I was watching this show. It was ran this random show. Me and my wife before we were married when we were just. Um, dating whatever we'd watch these random shows and it was a kind of like a reality show kind of like a competition show but it was i think army like mm-hmm. you know you grab regular people put them oh, in an army yeah. scenario you give them oh, like okay, missions okay. and it's like because they have a ranger they have a best ranger every year they have a best ranger competition which is a really hardcore competition yeah, yeah. well it was, it was it's you know it's a lot like the ftx a mm-hmm. lot like that but it's a whole like you know you're, you're there for like a month or whatever right. And same, but a lot of drill sergeant type situations, yep, yep. dropping, give me 20, 50, whatever, right? So it was towards the end of the season or whatever. And this girl was like, she was like, dang, look how strong and like muscular my arms are now. This is from, just from all the push ups we had to do yep. and stuff like that, just by happenstance. Sure, she was getting punished. Sure, she was learning to, you know, follow directions more meticulously and all the stuff that you learn from, you know, the whole, you know, orders versus punishment situation. But, as kind of a byproduct, if you will, she has some physical strength now. You know, yeah. I wonder if that has something to do with oh, it. Well, no, or definitely. From you're the... definitely, you're definitely making people stronger. There's no doubt about it. Yeah, and that's all. That's all positive for sure. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's no doubt. You, the, the great by- byproduct of of calisthenics as punishment is you get stronger. Yeah. In, but like in the, in the seals, it's weird. It's weird. It's not a thing. Yeah, it's not a thing. Like, hey, you're gonna drop down and give me fifty. Like that, literally, yeah. I never saw that happen a single 
Mm. It might have happened with new guys sometimes. Like yeah, occasionally sure. like a new guy that you're not getting through to him. Okay, guess what? Mm. But even with new guys, if you really want to get through to a new guy, what you want them to be good at is tactics, not push-ups. People in right. teams, you're supposed to do push-ups on your own, man. Yeah, that's kind of what it seems like. We're it. not in here to teach you how to do push-ups. Like you yeah. need to... You need to be in shape, it, but we want to make you better like you tactically. It seems like better things to do. Is yes. what I was going to say. But here, but at the same time, you can't help but wonder. Maybe that's just like that's a certain way of looking at it, which is good. It seems obvious, seems effective to me. But what if there's something like that? You know, like something from back in the day, some old school fundamental principle that that's kind of why you do it. That's super effective. Maybe, maybe that's why in the teams they don't do it because they want you to be self-disciplined. Yeah, not like specific. Yeah, not not self, not disciplined by the group, but imposed. But yeah, you don't want imposed discipline. Hmm. Interesting. So, well, regardless, I think that you should train hard because you don't want to have your soul get softened inside of your emasculated body. <laughs> that just sounds like something I don't want to be a part of. So I'll keep training. Back to the book. There is more skill in one might think in than might than one might think in making poor dispositions intentionally, but one must be able to change them into good ones in an instant. So he's talking about how you set yourself up in a bad position only to let the enemy Try and maneuver on that, but you're waiting for them to be ready and do something. You change your position and do something good, mm. like in jujitsu when you get, let someone set up a triangle, but you're just trying to pass their guard. Gotcha. Yeah. Nothing is more disconcerting to the enemy. He has counted on a certain thing, has disposed himself accordingly, and at the instant of attacking, it has changed. So, so this is this is pretty cool, right? This is a a, a good thing to remember I I like what he talked about is is psychological effect that it has on the enemy so the enemy sees something they expect something they want something to go a certain way so they arrange themselves for it and then right when they're getting ready to execute it they realize it wasn't what they thought and he says there's nothing more disconcerting and I'd say that's true with the person too Mm. you know the unexpected is what disturbs people especially you see this all the time in MMA where a guy gets close to a submission and then he get, the other guy gets out yeah. and he expended so much energy. You can see the yeah. you can see the the, f- the moral draining yeah. from their face when it yeah, happens. Yeah, it's bad. I it's get bad. that sometimes. Do you? Sometimes. sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> he, yeah. go, he goes on, I repeat, nothing confuses him so greatly and leads him into more serious faults. If he does not change his disposition, he will be defeated. And if he changes them in the presence of the enemy, he will still be defeated. Human spirit cannot meet it. <laughs> I'm trying to think of how that affects someone's psyche. Oh yeah, it affects. It definitely affects you psychologically. Like you throw the, you you think you're gonna get this person in the triangle. You put it on there, and then all of a sudden, boom! You realize it's not just that you missed the triangle. It's that you realize that you got played. You got played. Yeah, you got set right up. <laughs> and yep. that doesn't feel good. And that can definitely hurt your morale. Yeah, yeah, big time. That's a little different than just missing the move when you realize you got set up Actually, for that. It messes up your whole game. So okay, so you roll with stilts, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that's that's a, I don't want to say that's his whole game, but that's his game right there. So like if you go, you know, side control or mount or whatever, he has dangerous moves. He wants you there. When you, yes, exactly yep. right. So it's like, and every once in a while you get rolling with him like kind of hard. It'll seem like he's trying to defend the mount, but he's really letting you think that you got the mount, mm-hmm. right? You know, because you know if you're like if someone's letting you mount, you yeah. know they're letting you mount. Yeah. And if they're gonna spring some sort of a trap, it's gonna be more obvious if right. they're letting you do it. But you get him where he kind of lets you do it to the point where you don't realize you he's letting you. Want, yeah, yeah, you just got and then again. For and then sure. After a while, he keeps doing stuff like that too. You're like, bro, I don't even really want to do anything to him because yeah. he's just gonna set me. It's this is just a bunch of traps right now. Yeah. So it messes up your whole game. You can't do anything. Yeah. Like he, on your own accord, though. It's not like he's preventing you from doing anything. Yeah. It's like you're preventing yourself now. That's a that's a situation you, you have just, to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, that is very true. actually, that I is, figured it out. I figured out. In, um, I didn't figure it out. I figured out a method to deal with just that whole scenario with him, by the way. And he even like asked me afterwards. So I was like, "Oh, let's." I was going hard, and I was. You know how you get real like 
weary like okay i know he's mm-hmm. gonna send me so it was real uneventful roll so i was like hey let's go roll again and then i just loosened up and basically allowed him to spring whatever trap he wants and he then he did all this stuff and he was like hey you were rolling a lot lighter in that time i was like no bro i'm just trying to f- i'm trying to turn on the lights to all your traps that you mm. set you know so it's kind of like that thing it just comes with like the type of training like you can't regard the training as a competition yeah you know yeah, you, have you to gotta go in and be like otherwise you are not learning anything yeah but man in a in a war battle or in a competition scenario it's like it'll mess you, you up he, big time i'm trying to think if i ever got played like that on the battlefield <laughs> you know sometimes we'd hit a target mm. and it was real obvious that you know we had been i wouldn't say set up but like there's no one there like clearly the information that we got was wrong and you'd be kind of like dang you yeah. know be like, man, that, that wasn't good. Yeah, and really on a real rudimentary level, it that's what an IED is. You know, it's like they want to make it look like a trash can or a regular yeah. something you have to address or something like that. You know, some a place where you have to go anyway, the road, I don't know. Whatever. On a real simple level, that's kind of what that is. So now you're like, shoot, now we got to be weary of everyday yeah. things, normal protocol. We got to be weary of that. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a digger on the psychology for sure. Yeah. Back to the book. I do not care for either one. Oh, sorry. It says lines and entrenchments. So he's talking about lines and entrenchments, meaning defensive positions. I do not care for either the one or the other of these works. When I hear talk of lines, I always think I am hearing of talk of the walls of China. The good ones are those that nature has made. And the good entrenchments are good dispositions and brave soldiers. Again, just capitalizing on nature and saying that brave soldiers are more important than your position. Mm. Man always fears the consequences of danger more than danger itself. Totally true. When And I'll tell you what's equally, or you could throw in there, is the... Uh, the a- anticipation of danger is mm-hmm. probably the worst thing. Yeah, you know, I see this. Uh, okay. I see a lot of kids on the wrestling mat right now because it's wrestling season, yeah. and you can see the kids get nervous yeah. before they get on the mat. But then once they get on the mat, they're in the game. Yeah, and now you're now you're doing your job. Yeah, but the anticipation of what could happen. Yeah. Drives yeah. people crazy. When is that? Like you know, because you got it. You felt that before. Or you know, back the day when we were competing. Yeah. Like in jujitsu tournaments, the worst, especially back. Actually, your one of your last competitions mm-hmm. was my first competition. Really? By the way, yeah. Where was that? In LA, it was it was called like the Pan Ams of Submission Grappling. It wasn't the Pan Ams Pan Ams. Oh. It was like, I think like Submission Grappling. It was no. Good. How did I do? Uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't remember. Remember? Yeah, I remember seeing all the pictures because one of the. It's funny. One of the, like. It's not was an it a tournament. Pe- it was a tournament. Yeah. So. Remember Alicia photos? Remember who that? Who ran it? Who ran it? Who ran the tournament? I have no idea. I didn't even know there was tournaments, and I <laughs> saw one. Or, or Brand at the time was like, "Yeah, there's a tournament." I was like, "Oh, we can have tournaments." I was like, "Boom!" So I just jumped on it real quick. What was the iconic photo? I say it's iconic <laughs> because it's a kind of a long <laughs> Maybe story. That's but a strong it, word. Yeah, very strong. It's not iconic at all, actually. But it's okay. I'm so I'm we. I'm, I have this guy. His name is um, Jim. Um, you you'll probably know him, Jim. Mm-hmm. He. Uh, I have him in a, it's not an American, it's a straight arm lock. Mm-hmm. And I, I wound up tapping him out and Alicia photos, though, that was the photographer yep. at the time, the main one, yep. had a really good picture of it. It was such a good picture, it was on the front of her website, oh. the picture, right? That's why I call it iconic photo. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> full on I novice. Every, everyone knows that photo, everyone. <laughs> they probably do if they're competing back in the day, if they know Alicia photos, anyway. Um, the full on like novice division. Right. I was like, I had been trained for two months, twice a week, by the way, mm. for two months. Boom, not. Um, Still just dominating out there. Winning, Look at you. Winning. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I lo- actually lost. I lost my first match, took third. Nonetheless, doesn't matter. Um, so I know that you did it because when I was looking through the pictures, it was you compete. I think you were competing against like Sokuju or somebody. I think. Huh. But I, I remember you competed against so could you. Yeah, well, it, it was maybe I don't know some other black guy, but I don't know. Huh. I, I remember it was you because I remember like yeah. you. I'll have to check that out. Nonetheless, I'll, um, I'll have to explore that. But uh, what was the point? There? Oh yeah, uh, waiting for the match is like 
that's the nerve wracking oh, part. Yeah, yeah. Like rolling, even when you step on the mat and you see the guy in front of you getting right by, that's not nerve wracking at all. That's like every day you see that. There was a iconic picture of Sarge. <laughs> this is pretty iconic. And he, he was going against one of the Gracie's kids. So it was Henner or I think it was Halleck. Was it Halleck? I think so, yeah. And he's but he's double legging. You know yeah. what I'm talking about? Yeah. <laughs> Sarge has got like the savage double <laughs> leg. Which Sarge has a savage double yeah. leg. Uh, it's another thing when I see these uh, by the way, talking about Brian Sargent, uh, one of my buddies who has a jujitsu school in Connecticut. Connecticut. It's called Jiu Jitsu Life. But he has he's a good wrestler. But when I see these kids and he, he wrestled at Poway High School, which is a one of the best wrestling high schools maybe in the country I mean it's definitely incredible program mm. and he went there and wrestled there and I see and occasionally I'll see a kid that just has Sarge's attitude <laughs> and I saw one at this last tournament this kid was just all over hitting dog. I mean it, it looked it didn't look fair right <laughs> I mean he was just murdering this kid from Poway was getting after it was pretty awesome to watch mm. and you could see just boom, boom, boom is hitting the doubles. But it reminded me of the iconic, iconic picture of Sarge. Oh, there's a picture of it. So yeah, there's a picture of Sarge yeah. and they put him on they it was the, it was it was one of those pictures that was so good that they put it like on the cover screen. And I think I don't know if it was that one or if it happened later in the match. Mm. He was double legging him out of bounds, like he yeah. was into yeah, the yeah. table. Yeah, <laughs> it was just table. mayhem. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you gotta you gotta watch out for Sarge's double legs. He'll, he'll put you on your ass quick. Yep. And he won too. Sarge won. Hard to submit. So like if you just got taken down. That's two points. Right. And now what are you gonna do? Because you can't sweep Sarge, right? It's hard. Yeah. I mean, of hard. course you can, but it's hard. Yeah. You only have a few minutes. And it's hard to submit. Oh, but you got back to your feet. Cool. You just got taken out again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's the rub with the with the real good judo guys or wrestler guys. That's the rub. What's the rub? Oh, how do you solve that problem? Yeah, like, yeah. Become a better wrestler. <laughs> no, that, typically, that's not it. Yeah. Because when Tyrone Woodley, Tyrone Woodley fought Damian Maia, and Damian Damian is an incredible jujitsu player, mm -hmm. and he couldn't get Tyron down to the mat, yep. and every time he shot. I would hit my son <laughs> and because every time yep. every time Damien shot he would uh, Tyron would just stuff the shot and yep. I'd hit my son and go that's why you wrestle that's why you wrestle boy because yeah. you're gonna be able to take people down yeah and then once you get to the ground if you have the jujitsu well now you got problems yeah because Tyron didn't want to go to the ground with Damien no because that would have been very problematic for him yeah but Tyron Woodley is a wrestler oh yeah. you know was that you who said there's a difference between someone who can wrestle versus a wrestler. Yes, was that, that was said me. That? Yes, yes. Tyron some... Woodley is, right. and that's why I say that's not oh. the problem. That, or that's why I say that's not the solution. If you have a wrestler always taking you down, and the solution is to get better at wrestling, it's nope. not the solution because you, you want to get better at something that this guy's probably getting better. And this is just chances are. I'm yeah. not saying it's an absolute, but he's probably a getting better. B already super good yeah. at it. So it's like the solution he's, isn't he's, to chase something. He's that's, twelve years ahead of you. Yeah. He's eight years ahead of you in yeah. wrestling. Yeah. Yeah, so that's not the solution. I don't know what this I'm not is. saying don't wrestle. Well, I think I'll tell you what, this, what I think the solution is off the top of my head. You learn enough wrestling and then you figure out how to incorporate your jujitsu jiu into yeah. the wrestling so that, and, and I, I say this all the time and, and Dean will tell you the same thing. Dean will, uh, Dean will hesitate to shoot on me because he knows there's significant threats there, he'll shoot all day on a good wrestler because he doesn't care what happens. They're not gonna they're not gonna catch him yeah. most likely. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously a jujitsu wrestler, it's gonna happen. But and I feel the same way. I'll shoot I'll shoot all day on a on a good wrestler because I don't care. They're not gonna catch me anything. And if they do, I'll be able to do the proper defense and escape it. But Dean, no, like no, that's a real problem. Yeah, same with Andy. You shoot on Andy, you're, you know, it's like okay, that could be problematic. Yeah, and not even just pay for it. You can lose right, right there. Yeah, yeah. Andy and I have been a problem. Whoever shoots, lo whoever shoots loses. loses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because we're both have good anti wrestling. So yeah, that's it. That's the pro that's the solution right there. You got to figure out the the counter, the kryptonite right. to the wrestling. Right. In yeah. what a, in whatever way, because that's not just oh yeah, just do that. It, that's not how yeah. it is. It, it's but that's the direction. That's the solution. Yeah, and there's there's problems with that 
Well, there's not problems with that. One of the easiest ways is to be very, I guess this is a problem, is to be very non-aggressive. Because yeah. if all you're trying to do is avoid getting taken down, you already are, are a lot harder to take down than if you're, like if I go in and start trying to take down a wrestler, they're gonna put me on my ass. Mm-hmm. Because I'm trying to take them in, they know their counter's that much better, their timing's yeah. that much better, they hit the switch, boom, all of a sudden I'm, I'm down, yeah. you know? But if I'm just trying to avoid you, it's the same thing with somebody that's a really good striker. If you're just, if your goal is to, if you start striking with a striker that's better than you, yeah. you are more likely to get knocked out, you're more yeah. likely to get hit. Because you're playing their, that's the point, you're playing, playing their, their game. game. Yeah. And you don't wanna play their game. Mm-hmm. Now, what sucks about that, and it even happened in the Tyron Woodley fight, it was a boring fight because it was shots getting stuffed, yeah. stand up, some striking, shots getting stuffed, stand up, striking, shots getting stuffed. That's what the fight was. Yeah. It was a very boring fight because his goal was to not get taken down. Yeah. And he's a wrestler, so he had the capability of doing it, and that was that. I'll tell you what it is, what you do for, for a wrestling situation. This is one of those simple, it's not easy at all, but simple. You find a way to get to the back from the bottom. Well, that's yeah, it. that's great. I mean, yeah, you find a way to submit them. Submit them. That's great right. too. No, no, you know but I mean? get to the back because Tipe and Andre you Gaval get told me them to their back. No, get on their back. Sorry. Oh, for sure. Get on their back. Under he was, he told me this when he was gonna fight Chael Sonnen mm-hmm. for Metamorphs, and he was like, he was like, yeah, it's interesting fighting wrestlers or whatever. It's like they can provide like that. Uh, I'm totally paraphrasing. They can provide these really hard situations for you in jujitsu for many reasons they're super hard hard people to fight but if you can figure it out you got to figure out ways where wrestling provides weaknesses in a in a, in a jiu-jitsu scenario yeah and then if you watch the match sure enough like he was shell Sonny was really good at stuffing 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 and then you could see galva was like just slowly and then he got to the back got yeah. to the back and I, I used to coach dean with the same idea of you know, if he was going against a good wrestler, I'd say use your jujitsu. If he's going against a good jujitsu guy, I'd say use your wrestling. Huh. Dean would have a tendency, because of his personality, to want to go against them in their strength. Oh, yeah. So he'd try and out wrestle wrestlers. Try he'd try and out jujitsu, out jujitsu guys. Yeah. He would. He would. That's his natural tendency. Would be to go at people's strengths. Mm. And I'd have to like say no, do jujitsu against this guy, and then he'd do it and get what he needed to get. Mm. Dean. All right, back to the book. When one is obliged to defend entrenchments, one should post all the battalions directly behind the parapet because if once the enemy sets foot upon that, those in the rear will think of nothing but to save themselves. This is because of the consternation in men when something happens that they have not expected. Again, consternation is like shock. Mm -hmm. So he's again emphasizing the fact that when people aren't expecting something it is a It's a major downer for (laughs) it's a major downer (laughs) for it It interrupts what's happening. Yeah, and that's why you got to think of Contingencies that's one of the biggest things one of the best things about thinking about contingencies is just that you're aware of it's gonna Just that that you've thought about it for a half a second big time yeah. That makes you so much better off getting caught complete getting caught completely off guard I mean this happens in jiu-jitsu the thing that you get caught with is the thing that you didn't see coming Yeah, that's that's the thing that catches you the thing that surprises you and you're like mm-hmm. oh, how did that happen? Yeah, it surprises you. That's what you get caught with yeah. Even like in your house like that's the one I think of a lot Where you know when you're in, in your house and and if you think of like what if there's someone in here? Oh, yeah right now yeah. you're not even necessarily of how scary that would be necessarily but it's like okay what if there's someone in here at least I'm ready for the fact that someone's in here my you know? daughter my eight-year-old daughter will try and scare me yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and she'll hide somewhere and if I don't expect it I get startled you'll get yeah she'll yeah. get you yeah. and then and then what I do is I just you know you're talking about punishments <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> no what I know sure. I punish myself Oh, you that means, okay, yeah. Good. That's good. So she, so she scared me twice last year. Dude. Like that actually made me a little bit startled. She tried ninety-eight times. <laughs> Ninety-six of them were ineffective. All right. But well, I'll what tell was you your what, punishment? I, I punished myself. Burpees. Yeah. Well, what was burpees? It? Burpees. Got yeah. it. Burpees. Cool. And then, but I really enjoy scaring people. Sure. 
a lot. I don't know why. I find it very entertaining and funny and satisfying. So I do when I scare people. It like makes them cry. Yeah, I can <laughs> see that. <laughs> wait, wait. So how do you scare them? Do you oh, do the man. like the loud noise one, oh, or I do, do you... everything? Yeah, you know, because a lot of times the loud noise isn't the scary thing, right? And sometimes the scratching at the window it's is the a lot dread. more scary. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes you think you're home alone, and you think your dad's gone, <laughs> and then all of a sudden there's like scratching at the window, no. and then there's a noise of the door opening, and you start calling out for your dad, but he doesn't answer. No. And then there's more scratching at the window, and then all of a sudden there's someone with a mask on that comes into the room <laughs> with a <the laughs> flashlight. Yeah, you can't do that, man. That's that's so, like yeah. that's a violation. You can't do that. No, with a but mask. I do do that. Yeah, yeah, I can I, see that. I, yeah. So, anyways, that's that. Back to the book. He's uh, well. Let me catch us up to where we were talking about the shock that happens when people don't expect something. Back to the book. This is a general rule in war and decides all battles and all actions. It comes from the human heart and is what induced me to compose this work. I do not believe that anyone yet has attempted to find there find there the reasons for the poor success of armies. Thus, when you have stationed your troops behind a parapet, they hope by their fire to prevent the enemy from passing the ditch and mounting it. If this happens, in spite of the fire, they give themselves up for lost, lose their heads, and fly. It would be much better to post a single rank there armed with pikes whose business will be to push the assailant back as fast as they attempt to mount. And certainly, they will execute this duty because it is what they expect and what they prepared for. If with this, you post infantry formed according to my method into centuries at a distance of 30 paces from the entrenchment, these troops will see that they are placed there to charge the enemy as fast as he enters and attempts to form. They will not be astonished to see the enemy enter because they expect it and will charge vigorously. Instead, if instead they had been placed on the parapet, they would have fled. That is how a trifle changes everything in war and how human weaknesses cannot be managed except by allowing for them. That's that's heavy right there. Yes, yeah, deep. Human weaknesses cannot be managed. You have to allow for them. Think about that. Yeah. You know, you have to do that all the time as a leader. Yeah. You have to well, you have to try and do it as a leader. Because if you don't try and manage these weaknesses and you 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 don't allow for them then they're gonna they're gonna jam you up as you would say yeah so you got somebody with a big ego you you got to put you got to put them in a situation where that ego is gonna flourish and not be offended and and when it does get offended you got to allow for that and how you're gonna adapt to it yeah it's like expecting perfection you know you know like if you expect perfection yeah well you're gonna be let down a bunch yeah, is what I'm saying. So if you allow for yeah. imperfection, it's yeah. kind of you can you can just manage better. So there's two major points, you know. Number one, if you set people up so that what they ex- what they expect to happen happens, they're going to have a better chance of achieving what it is you want them to achieve. Because mm. if these guys are in the parapet and all of a sudden they get run upon and they're surprised by it, and their mission was to defend the parapet, well now they're they're getting overrun. Whereas if you say no, once the parapet gets taken, you attack. Now they're they know the parapet's gonna it's not gonna be a surprise to them. They expect it to happen, and then when they, they get the opportunity, they're gonna get in there and get after it. Mm. But man, allowing the the manage managing human weakness, only the only way you can do it is by allowing for it. At least some measure of it. Yeah. Good. Good lesson learned. That's something you can think about as you lead people. You can think about, hey man, this is a little weakness here. And if I don't allow for that, I don't give that some room. And I count on, you know, uh, Flynn, Flynn from Echelon Front, newest member of Echelon Front, but he just wrote an article about a guy. He was stationed on a ship before he got to the teams. And he was saying this guy had been late for work, and but he was trying to bring the guy along, had a lot of potential, blah, blah, blah. Anyways, they go to actually do a uh, important training mm. with their weapons on the ship that they were on, and the guy missed the ship leaving port. And he says, you know, I should have fired the guy before this, and now I'm out here, I don't have this primary guy, and he let down me and let down the ship and everything like that. But he didn't account for human weakness. He, you know, he thought that he could bring this guy along, but he just, you know, it's one of those things. If you don't allow for that human weakness in there, you might be, you might be getting left high and dry, yeah. which is not good. That's in the 
made that thing on the echelon front web page which is called the platoon hut yeah, yeah. and we're okay. just like writing little I guess it could be referred to as a blog <laughs> It's not really a blog because a blog to me seems a very, you know, just hey, we're just gonna write whatever. We're bloggy. Yeah. So this is this is some little, I guess you might want to call them articles. Yeah, and there's like le- like le- little lessons. Yeah, in yeah, there, of course, right? little lessons. Yeah, yes. it. I, yeah, I liked. I enjoy a pl- yeah, platoon no, hut. The post platoon from hut. From time to time. And the reason we called it platoon hut is because that's where you'd sit around and talk shop. I guess right, we right. talk about other things, but when you get back from a training op. Because mm-hmm. when you're overseas, you, you still have a platoon hut, but it's not the platoon. I guess it is the platoon hut. But anyways, yeah, even there. So when you get back from an operation, you come and you debrief, and you you get done with the official debrief, but then you go into the platoon hut. Uh, and you're yeah, about, yeah. Hey, man, you should have done this. And so, yeah, so huh. that's one of those. He, he as a young uh, surface warfare officer in the Navy, didn't allow for the human weakness of this young sailor, and it mm. cost him. Going back to the book the Greeks were very skillful in the art of war and well disciplined but their large phalanx was never able to contend with the small bodies of Romans dis- disposed in this formation now he goes on to there's a guy named Polybius and he goes on to quote a huge chunk of text from Polybius Polybius was a Greek historian and Polybius actually talked about why the Roman armies could defeat the phalanx and pretty interesting so here's what he said it is easy to demonstrate by many reasons that while the phalanx retains its proper form and full power of action no force is able to stand against it in front or in support of the violent attack so while the phalanx is in order you're not going to be able to defeat it. So the phalanx is a military formation, and he talks a little bit about what it's made up of here. When the ranks are closed in order to engage, each soldier, as he stands with his arms, occupies a space of three feet. The spears in their ancient form were 17 cubits long. A cubit is about 18 inches. But for the sake of rendering them more commodious in actions, they have since been reduced to 14. Of these, four cubits are contained between the part which the soldier grasps in his hands and the lower end of the spear behind, which serves as a counterpoise to the part that is extended before him. And when and the length of this last part from the body of the soldier when the spear is pushed forwards with both hands against the enemy is in consequence ten cubit, cubits. From hence it follows that when the phalanx is closed in its proper form, Every soldier pressed within the necessary distance with respect to the man that is before him and on his side the spears of the fifth rank are extended to the length of two cubits and those of the second third and fourth to a still greater length beyond the foremost rank. It is manifest manifest then that several spears differing each other in the length of two cubits are extended before every man in the foremost rank. And when it is considered likewise that the phalanx is formed by 16 in depth, it will be easy to conceive what must be the weight and violence of the entire body and how great the force of its attack. So you got guys 16 people deep, 16 people deep. And they've got these spears and they adjust the spears depending on where you are in the rank so the guy that's five ranks back still has a little bit of his spear sticking out and by the way if one of those guys goes down there's another 14 people there Mm -hmm. ready to take his place so the phalanx was locked together the shields protecting the person to your left and it's like a porcupine of death (laughs) locked together (laughs) and obviously the the Greeks were hardcore warriors, and this is what they used. And they used to def- crush people with this phalanx, crush them. Spears and shields, that's all you see. Mm. Now, Polybius talks about what the Romans did and what their setup was. 
Back to the book. To each of the Roman soldiers, as he stands in arms, is allotted the same space of three feet. But as every soldier in time of action is constantly in motion, being forced to shift his shield continuously so that he may cover any part of his body against which a stroke is aimed, and to vary the position of his sword so as to either push or to make a falling stroke, there must be also a distance of three feet. The least that can be allowed for performing these motions with advantage between each soldier and the man that stands next to him both on his side and behind him. So the Romans are in the same similar position, Mm. but they're moving individually inside these little positions. So they're not working together, they're, they're more mobile. It will be easy, therefore, to conceive that while the phalanx retains its proper position and strengths, no troops, as I have before observed, can support the attack of it in front. So if you're going against the phalanx, you're going to lose if you're going front. Mm. To what cause, then, is it ascribed that the Roman armies are victorious and those defeated that employed the phalanx? So how is it that the, the Romans were able to beat the phalanx? This is the cause. In war, the times and places of action are various and indefinite. But there is only one time and place, one fixed and determined manner of action that is suited to the phalanx. In the case of a general action, if an enemy be forced to encounter with the phalanx in the very time and place which the latter requires, it is probable in the highest degree that the phalanx must obtain victory. So if you fight the phalanx where the phalanx wants you to fight it, meaning on a big open area, Mm. you're going to lose. But if it is possible to avoid an engagement in such circumstances, and it is indeed easy to do it, there is nothing to be dreaded from this order of battle. And here's where it gets to the nitty gritty. It is well known and an acknowledged truth that the phalanx requires a ground that is plain and naked and free from obstacles of every kind, such as trenches, breaks, and brows of hills or the channels of rivers, and that any of these are sufficient to impede it and to dissolve it the and to dissolve the order in which it was formed. If the enemy coming down up, down on it should lead their army through the country, plundering the cities and ravaging the lands, of what use then will be the phalanx? So all you have to do is get them on some rough terrain. You get them on some rough terrain, and that phalanx, I mean, it's, it's hard to march already. We know that, but now we're marching against weird terrain, mm. and the guy in front of you trips and falls. Well, he, what does he hit? He hits a rock, and now that makes this guy fall, and all of a sudden we got a big disaster on our hands. Mm. Back to the book. When the Romans attack the phalanx in the front, they never employ all their forces so as to make their line equal to that of the enemy, but lead on only a part of their troops, and the rest they keep in reserve. Now, whether the troops of the phalanx break the line that is opposed to them or whether they are broken themselves, the formation peculiar to the phalanx is alike dissolved. So even if they win that initial onslaught, even if the phalanx wins that, the phalanx is out of order. Mm. If they pursue the fugitive or if, on the other hand, they retreat and are pursued, in either case, they are separated from the rest of their own body. And thus, there is left some space which the reserve of the Roman army takes care to seize and then charges the remaining part of the phalanx. But the charge is not made against the front, but in the flank or the rear. Since it is easy then to avoid the conditions that are favorable to the phalanx, and since those, on the contrary, that are disadvantageous, disadvantageous to it can never be avoided it is certain that this difference alone must carry with it a decisive weight in time of action so let them get a little bit disrupted once they're disrupted flank them Mm. the troops of the phalanx lose all their strength when they engage in separate companies or man on man the Roman order, on the contrary, is never attended even on such occasions with any disadvantage. Among the Romans, every single soldier, when he is once armed and ready for service, is alike fitted and engaged, fitted to engage in any time or place or on any appearance of the enemy, and preserves the, always the same power and the same capacity in action, whether in separate companies or man to man. So, big destructive element in front of you, 
don't go head on head with it we've learned this over and over again you might want to distract it sure but then you hit them from the flank Mm -hmm. and don't face people on their best category Mm -hmm. right don't wrestle against the wrestler don't do jujitsu against the jujitsu guy don't box against the boxer don't go at them and don't do it where they want to do it Mm -hmm. that's real important disrupting the phalanx Mm -hmm. Now he talks about attacking entrenchments, which again, these are defensive positions. When an entrenchment is to be attacked, an attempt should be made to extend the lines as much as possible. Makes sense, right? I just don't wanna, I wanna let, make the person think that we're gonna attack him on the whole, mm. the whole line that he's got. This will make the enemy fearful everywhere so that he will not withdraw troops from any point to reinforce that which you intend to attack even after he discovers it. This makes many of his troops useless. This was D-Day, so what we did on D-Day. You know, they did those massive deception operations. The Brits, the Americans, they built those fake tanks and fake planes and put them all, they, they were inflatable. You've seen that stuff, right? Have you seen that? Oh, know. yeah. The Americans and the Brits, when we were trying to, to confuse Hitler about where we were going to attack D-Day, mm. they made these, they made like fake airplanes and fake tanks and they put them in different locations that indicated that we'd probably be attacking this spot instead of that spot mm. and, and it all worked mm. and and so he had to defend the whole line he actually defended those areas where they thought the attack was coming more than they defended the area where d-day was huh. little deception operation back to the book too much attention cannot be paid to spies and guides they are like eyes and are equally necessary to a gen- general. He is uh, too much money cannot be spent to get good ones. These men should be chosen in the country where the war is being fought. They should be intelligent, cunning, and discreet. Spies. The commanding general. I have formed a picture of a commanding general, which is not chimerical. I have seen such men. The first qualities, the first of all qualities is courage. Without this, the others are of little value since they cannot be used. The second is intelligence, which must be strong and fertile in expedience. The third is health. He should possess a talent for sudden and appropriate improvisation. That's a good, that's, you don't expect that. A talent for sudden and appropriate Improvisation. If I didn't make this clear enough, he's kind of going through the characteristics that he believes a good commanding general should have. He should be able to penetrate the minds of other men while remaining impenetrable himself. Hmm. He should be endowed with the capacity of being prepared for everything with the acti- with activity accompanied by judgment with the skill to make proper decision on all occasions and with exactness of discernment. Good lists. He should have a good disposition, free from from caprice and be a stranger to hatred. And caprice is like, you're just gonna change your mind all the time. Mm. He should punish without mercy, especially those who are dearest to him, but never from anger. Mm, okay, because remember earlier he was talking about be, yeah, kind of chill with it with the lashings. Yeah. But he says you should punish without mercy, especially those who are dearest to you. And I think that goes to what he was saying about troops. Hey, you're going to draft people. You got to make sure you draft the the rich people too. Mm. And I think he's saying you got to treat people fairly, mm. right? Even when you're even when it's one of your boys. Them. Yeah. yeah. He should always be grieved when he is forced to execute the military rules and should have the example of Manilius constantly before his eyes. And Manlius, actually, actually, Manlius, he was like a Roman uh, hero during, during the Gallic siege. And he, but beyond that, he was sort of like a, I want to call him a human rights advocate, but maybe that's too strong of a word. But anyways, he ended up getting uh, crucified, uh, not crucified, thrown from a thrown from a great height and killed as his execution. But he's sort of seen as a guy that stood up 
Mm. He, he almost was in like an Alamo scenario, mm. like in Texas when the, when they when they stood and were killed. He was in one of those situations, but he wasn't killed mm. during that Gallic siege of Rome. Anyways, back to the book. He should discard the idea that it is he who punishes and should persuade himself and others that he only administers the military laws. With these qualities, he will be loved, he will be feared, and without doubt obeyed. The functions of a general are infinite. He must know how to subsist his army and how to husband it, how to place it so that it will not be forced upon to fight except when he chooses, how to form his troops in an infinity of different infinity of different dispositions how to profit from that favorable moment which occurs in all battles and which decides their success all these things are of immense importance and are as varied as the situations and dispositions which produce them in order to see all these things the general should be occupied with nothing else the day of the battle the inspection of the terrain and the disposition of his troops should be prompt like the flight of an eagle this done his orders should be short and simple as for instance the first line of attack the first line will attack and the second will be in support boom that's it keep it simple the generals under his command must be incompetent indeed if they do not know how to execute this order and to perform the proper maneuvers with their respective divisions thus the commander-in-chief will not be forced to occupy himself with it nor be embarrassed with the details for if he tempts to be a battle sergeant and be everywhere himself he will resemble the fly in the fable that thought he was driving the coach Thus, on the day of the battle, I should want the general to do nothing. His observations will be better for it. His judgment will be more sane, and he will be in a better state to profit from the situations in which the enemy finds himself during the engagement. And when he sees an occasion, he should unleash his energies, hasten to the critical point at top speed, seize the first troops available, advance them rapidly, and lead them in person. These are the strokes that decide battles and gain victories. The important thing is to see the opportunity and know how to use it. So what he's saying there is you got to be detached. He's saying you got to be detached, and then you got to stay back and you got to look around. Now he also says once you see the critical moment, you got to get up in there and make it happen. Mm-hmm. But he's saying you definitely can't get laid down in the weeds. You can't be the sergeant that's trying to do everything. Back to the book, many commanding generals only spend their time on the day of the battle in making their troops march in a straight line, in seeing that they keep their proper distances, in answering questions which their aides de camp come to ask, in sending them hither and thither, and in running about incessantly themselves. In short, they try to do everything, and as a result, do nothing. So this is a great, this is just... You're in a leadership position. You try and do everything yourself. You're not going to do anything at all. Then mm. it's the same. That's the same thing as prioritize and execute. If you try and solve all the problems that are happening at the same time, you're not going to solve any of those problems. Mm. They appear to me like men with their heads turned, who no longer see anything, and who are only able to do what they have done all their lives, which is to conduct troops methodically under their orders, uh, under the orders of a commander. How does this happen? It is because very few men occupy themselves with the higher problems of war. They pass their lives drilling troops and believe that this is the only branch of the military act. When they arrive at the command of armies, they are totally ignorant and in default of knowing what should be done, they do what they know. That is so classic. Mm -hmm. It's so classic. When people don't know, they don't understand something, they do what they know how to do. They Mm -hmm. they always default into what they know how to do. Mm -hmm. Their minds are closed. One of the branches of the art of war, that is to say drill and the method of fighting, is methodical. The other is intellectual. For the conduct of the latter, it is essential that ordinary men should not be chosen. 
unless a man is born with a talent for war he will never be other than a mediocre general it is the same with all talents in painting or in music or in poetry the talent must be inherent for excellence all sublime arts are alike in this respect that is why we see so few outstanding men in science centuries pass without producing one application rectifies ideas but does not furnish a soul for that is the work of nature you know I just answered a question on Twitter I think it was um, and I basically said well you know you can't do whatever you want just because you believe in it and you have hard work and discipline like that that doesn't mean you can do whatever you want like as a career or something yeah like mm-hmm. and I always use the example like I couldn't be oh. an Olympic let's say an Olympic weightlifter or in fact I don't know that there's any Olympic sport that I would be that I have the um, genetic makeup to be able to to be able to compete at the Olympic level of course we could go back and maybe that's possible from a child but I don't feel like it but even right now you know if you take that to the extreme that means hey you know what if I have the focus and if I have the discipline I can become an Olympic wrestler now High jumper. Olympic high jumper, right? How's that vert looking? <laughs> so you see what I'm saying? Now, yes. my opinion is that is not true. Mm. And some people are not going to achieve certain things that they may want to achieve no matter how hard they want to do it. And I, you know, most people are like, yeah, that's realistic. Some people are like, no, you can believe, if you believe it, you can achieve it. It's like, if I could believe it, if I could achieve it because I believed it, dude, I'd be like, <laughs> I'd be, I'd be just all winning sure. everything. Sure. It's not that easy. Yeah. You got to believe it. You got to work hard at it. You got to have some natural capabilities. Mm-hmm. It's the way it is. I'm sorry to let everyone down. What was your line? It was one of those lines that you can kind of take with you. You said belief, something about... What is it? It's in, yeah, the no muster idea. you said it. it. Belief is not going to make anything oh, happen. Yeah. But at the same time, without yeah. belief, nothing's going to happen. And totally true. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, you've got absolutely. So yes, belief by itself won't make anything happen. Yeah. <laughs> that you know, some people sit around. Oh yeah, I believe I can do this. Yeah, so I'm yeah. going to achieve. No, no, no. If you want to achieve, you got to do something. Yeah. And and the same token that is also correct is that if you don't believe in what you're doing, then yeah, there's no way you're going to achieve it. Mm-hmm. You won't be able to gut through it. When it gets problematic, yeah. which it's certainly going to. So Sachs agrees with me that, hey, the work of nature has to be in play. Yeah. Otherwise, it's not happening. You might get to some level, but yeah, reality is. That's hard. I think that's a hard one to admit. To you, you don't seem you like you want to admit this. No, I think no, you're no. over there like you, if you wanted to go the distance. Put it this way. I, it seems really like that's not true. It seems like... You know, you maybe you just didn't work hard enough, even though you thought that you worked as hard as you possibly can. Mm-hmm. Maybe the fact it, it, this is what it seems like. But at the end of the day, I do agree with that. I, I mean, it's it's way clearer with physical stuff because yeah, physical limitations yep. are way more you know obvious. And um, there's there's I don't know. <laughs> well, let's face it. Let's say playing guitar because I play guitar, yeah. and I also now kind of play ukulele yeah yeah. (laughs) (laughs) but let's say playing guitar even if you practice and you can mechanically play guitar that doesn't give you the natural spark of creativity that is demanded if it did then every person that worked hard and played guitar would become a rock and roll star with great creative songs but it just doesn't happen yeah there's hundreds of thousands just in America there's hundreds of thousands of people that play guitar at an incredibly capable Proficient. proficiency right yeah. they can play every song that you hear on the radio yeah. but you know what they do for a living cover cover songs well they play cover songs they're also working as a banker somewhere yeah because they didn't have whatever creative thing that right. would give them to be able to create something that was new and that people wanted wanted to listen to 
Yeah. Th- that that needs to come from somewhere else. Yeah. The practice isn't going to get you there. Yeah. Some people learn it in the schools. Some people yeah. learn it on the streets. But I think you kind of got to be born with it, man. And that's yeah. a little tenacious D for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know. Yeah. The, and again, can like can you teach creativity? And even I, then, it's like yeah, but no. Yeah. Not really. Exactly. You know? I mean, compare yeah, the guy no. who's. And then where do you get it, really? You know, it's a, yeah, it, it's weird. It's just, I think that's really the reason that it is true, is because you can't put your finger on it. You can't mm-hmm. be like, yeah, just work as hard as you possibly can. Sure, that's going to well, impro- improve uh, your... Well, another classic example is look at the people, you know, if I go to an academic, a high-level academic environment mm-hmm. where everyone is, you know, incredibly intelligent, but not all of them are able to do something that, not all, all of them are able to succeed at the level that their that their heritage would point towards. Mm. So just because you got a sixteen hundred on your SATs and you did this and you went to this great college, there's a lot of people that did all those things and they're they're not what they themselves would consider successful. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so the reality is, there's something not there. Yeah. And like you said, I don't know that you can actually put your finger on it. Yeah. Because there's some other kid that didn't do any of that and made stuff happen. Yeah. And was extremely successful. There's thousands and thousands of examples like that too. Yeah. And so it's kind of like when you compare it like the proverbial person with all the potential versus someone with not that much potential and maybe the guy with the with le- less potential, there'll be exceptions where that guy made it. Mm-hmm. And then there'll be obviously like all these other scenarios where the guy with the potential doesn't doesn't make it. Make sure. it. So it's like, all right, you know, yeah. this guy's born with it. What but, up with him? But, kind of let's thing. take it to a new level, not just making it, but actually being a like the highest level. Yeah. For that person, you got to have the talent, and, and you got to have the work. Yeah. You got to do both. It tends to be this yeah. case. Check. <sighs> And he says the same thing here. I have seen very good colonels become very bad generals. I have known others who were great takers of villages, excellent for maneuvers within an army, but who, outside of that, were not even able to lead a thousand men in war, who lost their heads completely and were unable to make a decision. Any decision. So, he sees the same thing. And, and you, you know, I see that with business leaders. The business leader that you need to be the, at the beginning of your business is not the same business leader that you need to be once your business is more successful. You got to have this. Some guys are good at street fighting, right? Yeah. They're good at street fighting. Mm-hmm. They're not good at planning a war, mm-hmm. planning a campaign. And so you might win as a company if you're a leader at the street fighting level and you do good, you scrap it out. Then as you grow, if you don't transition mentally and become a different kind of leader, not mm. a different person, but a different kind of leader, you may not be able to win at the higher levels. Mm. So sure. that needs to get paid attention to. Back to the book. One should, once and for all, estab- establish standard combat procedures which the troops, as well as the general who leads them, know. I'm not the first person to talk about standard operating procedures at all. <laughs> mm-hmm. These are general rules, such as preserving proper distances on the march, when charging to charge vigorously, to fill up intervals in the first line from the second. No written instructions are required for this. It is the A, B, C of the troops, and nothing is simpler. Standard operating procedures. He also says that the general should have preserve an unfettered mind and not occupy himself with trifles. I am convinced that a skillful general could make war all his life without being forced into one. Hmm. That's the old, the real martial artist doesn't have to fight. Right, the art of fighting without fighting. Yes, yes. War can be made without leaving anything to chance. And this has and this is the highest point of perfection and skill as a general. So he now are there things that are left to chance in war? Yeah, 
there's a lot of things that are left to chance in war, but can you mitigate a lot of those? Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Back to the book. The words of the proverb, a bridge of gold should be made for the enemy is followed religiously. Meaning, I'm going to give, if the enemy wants to run, I'm going to build him a bridge of gold to, to run on. Mm-hmm. I'm not, you you want to run away? That's great. War is over. This is false. On the contrary, the pursuit should be pushed to the limit. And the retreat, which had appeared such a satisfactory solution, will be turned into a rout. A detachment of 10,000 men can destroy an army of 100,000 in flight. Nothing inspires so much terror or occasions so much damage for everything is lost. So you say, no, you don't let the enemy get away. When they're running, that's when you destroy them completely. This is not to say that it is necessary to give yourself up totally to the pursuit and follow the enemy with all your forces. But if the officer you have ordered in pursuit prides himself upon the regularity of his formation and the precautions of his march, there is no use in having sent him. He must attack, push, and pursue without cease. All maneuvers are good then. It is only precautions that are worthless. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. And that right there kind of wraps up the highlights of this book. Attack, push, pursue without ceasing. And I believe that is also known as getting after it. And in, in what's interesting is I think it's clear that as we continue to see these leaders throughout history that were able to lead through the harshest of conditions, there's a, obviously a lot of common principles that they share. And so the question is, okay, why do we keep reading them then? Mm. <laughs> why do I keep trying to confirm the same things? Why am I always looking actually for counterpoints as well that offer some kind of different solution like the one about Sun Tzu today you don't need to be early on the battlefield if it's cold out there and it's gonna wear down your troops don't be early mm-hmm. but from my perspective the more different angles that you see these things the same the, 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 the more different ways that you learn the same lesson the more clearly you understand it. if you learn an arm lock from three different people they're all gonna give you something different and it's the same thing we get something slightly different from all these strategic thinkers and we get better understanding of it and there are differences in what people say and I think it's good to look at the way those differences manifest themselves on the battlefield and throughout history because maybe there's one solution that's a little bit better than the one that I know right now so for me I'm going to continually try to reinforce, try and fortify, try and stay humble as Sachs talked about, continue to learn and relearn and discard what doesn't work and always try and get better. And I think that's all I've got for tonight. Yeah, I guess it better be. <laughs> I thought this was going to be a quick episode. No, no. All good. No, all right. I guess we should move quickly now. What do you think? Do you agree with me or no? <laughs> Doesn't sound like it. <laughs> we'll see what up. So, getting better. Yeah. Speaking of getting mm-hmm. better. Jocko has some supplements. They're Jocko supplements. Yes. So, you know you're going to get better. And I, there's, okay, so Super Krill is the Krill oil supplement. Good one. Super and Joint Warfare. And Discipline, okay, so we'll mm-hmm. say those three supplements. I'm, if anyone's wondering, if you're watching on YouTube and you're seeing me drink two things, I'm drinking two things. One of them is in a smart water bottle, and it is, I'm drinking Discipline. Sure. The other is in a Poland Spring bottle that I brought back from Maine to remind me of Maine, and I'm drinking that one, Jocko White. So, Those bottles are in New York too, by the way. Everywhere. Yeah, well, they're Poland. up in the Northeast. We'll say. Mm-mm-mm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but Sweet. you won't get you won't find Poland Spring out here. No. No. 
That's from me. Wow, you brought it back. That's dope. Nonetheless, so super krill, krill oil, better yes. than fish oil, factually. Yes. Factually. And then there's Jocko Super Krill, which is better than regular krill oil. Factually. No, no, there's 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 people out there not taking krill oil. And I'm not saying they should take krill oil. I they should take krill oil. <laughs> I was gonna say, that's just not what say I'm it. saying right now. I am saying if I will argue, I'll actually pretty much guarantee. Pretty much. I know that defeats the purpose of a guarantee, but <laughs> I'll pretty much guarantee that if someone's not taking krill oil, whether you jockle krill oil or not, and they take krill oil, they'll be like, dang, I should have started taking this krill oil before. Is it like learning jiu-jitsu when you start jiu-jitsu? You go, man, I should have started. I wish I started this when I was 13. It's just like that yeah. on a smaller level, yeah. on, a, on a joint maintenance level. Yeah, and joint warfare is what I'm feeling is, for me, that's kind of, it's new. Right, yeah. and I'm like, man, I wish I had this for a long time. Wait, the joint work? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because yeah. you can feel it's like you're getting ma- maintenance. Well, you should have came up with it earlier. I know, you know, I know. Next time, that's what you're gonna do. You come up with it earlier. That's yeah. what I think you should do. Nonetheless, they're for your joints. It's a good one. We're all working out. Hey, we're making something. <laughs> we're making a new uh, product. We'll say, sure. and it is. It's gonna be good. You're gonna like it. It's it's a it's a protein drink, mm. and it's gonna be. Aw- it's I've had. We've done two samplings. Given the ingredient, you know, so we give the ingredients to the supplement factory. Mm. They mix them, and we've gone through two. The f- two, we've gone through two iterations, mm-hmm. right? The first iteration. I was like, oh my God, this tastes good. <laughs> uh-huh. Wait, wait, what? I'm talking what? pure taste. Yeah, pure yeah, taste. Yeah. The first one, I was like, oh, this is this tastes good. Really good. Like the kind where you think this is a whole new thing. You know what I mean? Wait, like, a whole new thing? Like this is like a you know, treat protein's, a Yeah, because yeah, protein t- tastes like protein powders. Yeah, yeah. yeah tastes like crap. Protein. Yeah. And that was one of the things it, we researched to figure out how we could make it taste good. Legit good where you want not you're holding your nose and forcing down but yeah, yeah. You, The first sample that we got which I was in Maine when we tasted it mm-hmm. We stood there it was me Brian and Pete and we were standing there and we we all mixed it up together <laughs> And then poured it into three separate cups sure and, and everyone when we drank it everyone's like Quiet for a second and it was oh my god. What, what kind is it? Like, it's, what is well, it? this one was mint Chocolate, ah, yeah, I mean, chocolate. yeah, okay, and and it's just really good, and obviously the protein in it is awesome, yeah, and we've got some other things in it that are gonna make it more complete, but yeah, and then I just got the sec, but you know there was a couple adjustments that I wanted to make to the taste, just the pure taste, yeah, so we just made those adjustments. I got the second iteration in. It tastes even better than yeah, the first yeah, one, but so. I still I sent them back for one more. But hopefully, it'll only be one more iteration before we can start producing. It's not going to come out for a while. Uh, it takes a long time to get everything rolling, but yeah. Anyways, we have that in the future. That's interesting. Yeah, because I don't. I'm not into protein powder. I know you aren't. And I was back. You will bro, be. There, there is this one. I you forget will, what it's I'm called. I'm telling you. You will be. It won't you even be, be for protein. It'll be for like a yeah, dessert no, or something. It'll be like you, someone saying they're not into this is going to be like someone saying I'm not into ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> that's All how right. tasty it is. All right. So, well, good. I guess we'll see. I guess yeah. that's kind of the test, right? Yeah. In a way. In a way. In a yeah. way. It's a test. Well, good. Nonetheless, krill oil, joint warfare, and discipline, those are already out. Yep. Doing work. Discipline tastes good too. Yeah. That's another thing. You don't have to drink something that tastes like crap just because it's awesome for you. You can drink yeah. something that tastes good. And I'll tell you, one thing I've noticed, and I don't know if this is, I don't know what this means, but when I drink discipline, because mm. I work out in the morning, as I say all the time, I don't do a pre workout thing. It's not my thing, right? I, sure. work, I work out in the morning on an empty stomach. Yeah. And there's this old rock climber. And I can't think of his name right now. One of the famous old rock climbers, and he would. I read an article one time about him where he was he would climb while starving himself and wearing a weight belt because it was harder. And I was like, Yeah, I'm gonna do that. <laughs> I've done that all the time. I've done that ever since. Yeah. Anyways, the if you have some discipline, mm-hmm. the drink, then you will feel like. So when I get done working out, maybe like let's say you know I always say oh, I usually have some nuts around. It's gonna mix nuts just to kind of f- 
get in my gut a little food I've been I've been having some some you know a couple handfuls of mixed nuts and then having some discipline and I feel so like super uh, good <laughs> that then I'm just firing through the day and so mm-hmm. basically what I'm getting at is this is I've been eating even cleaner because I'm eating like I'm eating basically right now I think I'm eating once a day Dang. I'm eating discipline I'm drinking some discipline and then I'm going once a day just with like a, with like a good solid meal. And then yeah, it's man, it's good. It's good stuff. Anyways. And that's good. And that works for you. It's working good for you because I'll tell you why. When I eat less, I feel better. Yeah, that's and when weird. I eat less, I feel better. And so this is making me eat less. Now I'm not saying. Now believe me, when I eat, dude, I get it on. That's yeah, yeah. that's how I roll. When I yeah. eat, I get it on. And but this is just yeah. It's nice to be able to get to feel energized and sharp mentally without getting crazy. Do um, you think? That because you know that idea that what you eat less and you feel better, yeah. And I found that to be the case, and this is what I realized I found that to be the case only sometimes. And I was thinking, why is it like that sometimes? If I'm doing something like you know, when we go to the muster or something yep. like that, or oh, we're at sure. FTX, I, I we were doing something all day, you don't eat, and I wasn't eating, and yeah. It's kind of like, yes, but if you eat, it's kind of like your body goes into this like kind of rest mode yeah you know? for sure or, but if you eat a little bit or like just you know just oh, like i'm gonna stand out. oh it's time to eat okay we, we cruising now yeah eat yeah, yeah when let's you rest when you put now, some food in your does. body you're basically telling yourself you're going into cr- level seven echo cruising yeah, mode. Cruise. <laughs> technically recover mode <laughs> it's really kind of what it does and that's really what it felt like so yeah i found that that yeah if you so yeah. you probably have a bunch of stuff to do all all the time yeah yeah but when i'm for sure when you're like when I'm doing a fast, I want to be doing something. Yeah. Because yeah. if you sit around and think about food, yeah. bro, that's horrible. You yeah. feel like, like when Charlie Plum was talking about being in the Hanoi Hilton, and he's just thinking of. They were just literally sitting around thinking around. about food all the time. Yeah. Because there wasn't even anything to do. Yeah. And eating Terrible. food is actually a little bit of a cure or relief from boredom. Yeah, you know how you yeah, used to for back sure. in the day when you're a kid, you're just bored. You look in the for fridge sure. for I don't know. Something. You're not hungry. You're bored. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's funny because right now I got my, you know, my, it's wrestling season, so the the weight cuts are on, and they're not. Neither one of my kids that are wrestling are are cutting a bunch of weight, right. but it means that you don't. You're, it means that there's times when you don't eat for a day, right? Dang. Okay. So you get to see the effects of that. And my daughter's like, oh, I feel. She's like, Yeah, I feel fine. Mm. She's she doesn't I, get hangry or nothing. Yeah, she doesn't get hangry. I warned my wife. I said, "Hey, you need to watch out because when people because when you are cutting weight with fighters, they're cutting much more severe weight and they start getting in bad moods." Oh, fighters, you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They start getting in bad moods because they can't eat. Hangry. They get hangry. Yeah, hangry. but neither one of my kids are cutting that much weight. They're just kind of maintaining through the season. Did we, I don't know if we talked about hangry like that's a for real thing because this is what it is when you <laughs> when you I mean by like physiologically yeah. so that your frontal cortex or prefrontal frontal I don't know whatever the front of your brain the part that's I don't like know you're makes, the scientist that apparently. makes <laughs> decisions uh, and empathy and like all these things get compromised when you're wait when you're what hungry oh come on man listen I'm to me. calling cr- no, 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 listen, I'll tell you listen, why because listen. because I believe that if you if if you did, made all those things less effective then we wouldn't be here as a species because every time we got hungry in the past we would have gotten all confused and frustrated and we yeah, wouldn't be able so, to hunt but the bottom line is the opposite I think is true back in the day <laughs> if you needed to hunt something down you yeah. had to be sharp so when you didn't eat it made you sharper and more attuned that's how I feel Okay, uh, that's not what you know what I read and heard. But uh, hey, I'm not isn't saying it you're weird wrong. that you can go on the internet and find an ar- two <laughs> scientific articles that say the exact uh, opposites. Just, just follow me. So, hangry, from what I read, scientific correct, term, correct? Because well, they didn't use the word hangry, but oh, empathy, and this is with like if you get hungry or um, sleep deprived. Uh huh. Whatever. Um, this, yeah, just a part of your brain kind of it doesn't shut down completely. It just becomes oh, I forgot. I, I, less yesterday, less. yesterday I went to sleep. I went to bed sure. at, at eight thirty at night. Dang, <laughs> that's a good one. Yeah, I woke up at like three fifty, and I was kind of I was like, dang, that felt good. Yeah, I was, but I didn't sleep almost at all the night before, so I was recovering. I needed to put some more back in the bank, and everyone says you can't do that. Yeah, Emerson, you can't catch up on sleep. I just did. Yeah, I don't know. I just did. I bro. feel like you For can. Real. Yeah, yeah, I caught up on sleep. 
Mm-hmm. I never let you finish your your scientific explanation. So, yeah, yeah, what was the deal? Uh, you it just you're just less, cortex less or whatever. empathy. Um, so you know you'll treat people worse. Oh. technically. Um, so yeah, hangry. That, that's apparently right. from what I read is is an well, actual thing. Maybe not so. Maybe it ups your aggression. Gonna, yeah, maybe it, it ups your aggression. Maybe yeah. it does make you sharper. When you're sharper, you're not taking any crap from anybody, so you're more aggressive towards them because you want to go out and hunt and kill something. Yeah, you, so maybe I do agree with your you, weird science. You say tomato, I say tomato. <laughs> you know, you be aggressive, but nonetheless, um, yeah, it's a real thing. Apparently, okay. Who knows? I don't know. Not to say that everyone's going to behave in a certain way. I'm just saying that's what happens maybe. internally. Maybe. Maybe not. Nonetheless, get disciplined. It'll cognitively enhance. So if your prefrontal or frontal cortex, I forget which just one. Just both of them. Both of them. If your frontal <laughs> thing in your brain is shutting down, boom, take that discipline. The cognitive enhancer is going to help it out a lot. Don't be hangry, even if you're hungry. Guess where you can get these things? At originmain.com. There's a lot of cool stuff on there. Origin Maine also has geese, rash guards, various clothing items, all made in America. That's a good spot. Just check it out. Look on there. There's a lot of cool stuff on there. If you want something, get something. Also, if you're into workout equipment to populate your home gym, it's good having a home gym, by the way. One of my friends is coming into town. And he's like, yeah, let's catch a workout. I'm like, we don't have to go to a gym and catch a workout. Work out at home to do something else. Nonetheless, it made me think of how good it is to have a home gym. Nonetheless, if you have your home gym, you want to populate it even a little bit, get your workout stuff from on it. That's what I think. It's the cool one. You can do various interesting workout routines with the equipment, unlike Jocko. Jocko's workouts are super boring, even (laughs) though you do have kettlebells, which I respect. Yeah, and anything you want to add on that? No, man, that's it. Are you sure about as that? As far as the workout thing. What about the kettlebell No, no, thing? no, the kettlebell, you're good, bro. You're good, you're okay. solid, and I'm sure you're getting very strong, and I'm sure, you know. In, in case everyone doesn't know, yeah, Echo no, no, is no. running his mouth, and I use that term, like, with, I'm not just throwing it out there. Mm-hmm. I really was running my mouth, and you're really pissed about yeah. it, too. Yeah, that you have a what? How much is your heaviest kettlebell? 90. 90, 90 pounds. Big foot, boom. And my heaviest kettlebell, was 88 pounds uh-huh. this is no longer a problem now <laughs> my heaviest kettle bells plural because i have two, two is 48 kilograms or 106 pounds Dang. commonly referred to as the beast <laughs> so nonetheless mine are from on it they're the cool ones and you can get other cool exercise stuff there so go on it.com slash jocko check out the stuff there if you want to get something also, when you get your copy of Reveries on the Art of War by Maurice de Sachs. It's a good one. I like those manual kind ones, you know, yeah. the one that goes yep. by. I like, know. It's, if you think about it, there's really three types of podcasts that are happening. One is q mm-hmm. Two is manual strategies about war three is human nature inside war so those are kind of yeah when i'm reading a book i'm like oh yeah this is kind of like one of those yeah yeah so this would be with napoleon's maxims yeah you yeah. Know, something like that the art of war yeah, by yeah. sun tzu so we've yeah. done qu- quite a number of books like that yeah and you know i get a little something different from each of them because if you think about it he says that you have to pay attention to the human heart Mm -hmm. Well, where are you going to learn about the human heart? He didn't say much about it. As much as he said you need to know about it, he didn't say much about it. Where are you going to find it? You're going to find it by reading people that were actually in war and start to understand where their heart was in this whole gig. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting, too, because they're laid out in these specific contexts, you know, like um, like. Sun Tzu, he's he's talking about you know a certain time period, a certain place, and mm-hmm. then you see a Vietnam one, and then a World War, and they're, so they're talking about okay, these principles at this time, and yeah. this is why they were. Well, it was interesting to, to do I Drang and How More because it was his battle, two podcasts on his battle, and then his book that he wrote about leadership. So you mm-hmm. kind of got to see, maybe I don't know, I don't know if there's anything. Now we've seen some of that when, for instance, you got Napoleon's maxims. Right, mm-hmm. and then we got to hear from a Napoleonic foot soldier. Yeah, so you yeah. get to kind of see see, yeah. see the war, what the war was like, what the human heart was was going on with the human heart, and then what was going on with the minds of the strategician. Yeah, 
I don't even know if that's a word. Strategy. Sure. I think so. Just became. You know what's cool, cool is the English language. You can words. They 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 come about. Yeah. They just get formed. Yeah, that's a catch. There's a time too. where there was no word. And then that word is there. Yeah, boom. And All of a sudden, if you look word. at the OED, which is the Oxford English Dictionary, it tells you where the root word came from, and then it has like first usages. So there's yeah. some words. This word is this fir, this word was first in print in 1622 in this yeah. work of art or this work of literature. Yeah, you know what's, what's crazy too is like words will go in these cycles where they'll be used. So like like yeah. ain't right mm. if you say ain't that's like yeah that's an improper thing it's not really yeah. a word blah 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 ain't was actually used by like high upper class mm. people back in the day like a long mm-hmm. time ago and like ain't and shant and all these like yes. words like i shan't you know all this yeah. and ain't was one of them yeah, it was one go. of them and I, I forget the deal but someone in the lower class started using it and they were like oh they're using it now or something like that yeah. so it went out and now it's like, oh, that's not a word, the, but it, it is a word. The Eng- the language in general, but definitely the English language. I studied English in college, and but the the classes that I took, some of the classes that I took, were, would focus on that, which was pretty, inter- which was always very interesting to me, very interesting to me. And I think the reason it's interesting to me is because language is how we communicate. Communication is how we lead. Yeah. So if you don't know what words you're using or you can't find the right word to articulate what it is you're trying to say, mm-hmm. you're going to have a harder time getting your message across. When you have a harder time getting your message across, it's harder for you to lead. Yeah. So and then if you kind of look at the big picture of that, it's kind of like you have then then you kind of in a way should know slang and stuff like that. For too. sure. For because sure. if you're over here talking, quote unquote, all proper to people who aren't used to hearing For all sure. property, they're going to be like, what's this guy talking about or whatever? That is definitely true. And it's not just about language there. It's about culture as well. Yeah. And, and you know, one of the cool things that when I grew up and I was kind of, you know, it, getting into the hard and I was in the hardcore scene. Right. Mm-hmm. It exposed me to people and things that I wouldn't have seen if I would have stayed in my small New England town. Yeah. So. When I got to the world, meaning got out of that small town and now I was in the military, I was able to understand better than I would have if I didn't. Yeah. And I think that's important. Yeah. Yeah, it helps for sure. Yeah. Okay. How's this word? Irregardless. Right? Irregardless. No, it's not even a word. Right? That's what they said. So I had this bet. This is a long time. This is like over 10 years ago. I had this bet with this coworker of mine and- I, for whatever, I think my dad taught me like, regardless, that's not a word, you know. And he'd always like correct you. Yeah. So you know how it imprints in your mind like, someone uses the word irregardless, they should be corrected. That was kind of imprinted in my mm-hmm. subconscious. <laughs> so it happened at work. Echo Charles, grammar Nazi. Yeah, coming but at for you a live. little bit I was yeah. for a little bit. It was Come more on, just out of one. fun, but nonetheless, he, um, no, she was a girl. I said, irregardless, not a word. And she was like, yeah, it is. And I was like, no, irregardless is like a misuse misuse of a word. It's right. not irregardless. It's regardless. Irregardless is a misuse of a word. It's not a word. She's like, well, if it's a if it's a word, if it's a misuse of a word, it's the word for the misuse of this specific word. And I'm like, it's not a word. What the hell did that just mean? Yeah, but it, she's saying she's saying basically if you can say it and you can spell it and it's like if it's a, a little name for something. If it's, it's not name, the name of anything. It's though. a name for a misuse of a word. Is what that was her no. argument. That's okay. what I, that's what did I was you, saying. Did you win money? Please. No, I did not win the money. Did you bet so, money? No. So we're we. It never got resolved between me oh, and her. In well, fact, we hated. it. I think we kind of hated each other. After yeah, that, I would because it got too. heated. <laughs> we actually didn't hate each other. It was cool, but nonetheless, that was her stance. My stance is: you can't just invent a word. You can't just use a word wrong, invent another word because you're wrong. And then be like, oh, now it's a word. Now I'm right. All of a sudden, you can't do this. That's not how it works. Yeah. And then, so I look it up in the dictionary. It, yeah, it was haunting me. So when I went over, I looked it up in the dictionary. Sure enough, the thing was there. And it said yeah. the misuse yeah. of the, the or yeah. the common misuse of yeah. regardless. So I'm, but I'm still confused. Like, is that a word? Mm. And here's the thing. I talked to Jade about it. Yeah, it bothered me a lot. Yeah. So I talked to Jade about it, and he was like, bro, that's kind of how the language is. Uh, he's you right. You get enough people misusing regardless, yes. saying irregardless, boom, all of a sudden it gets shuffled right into the yep. rotation as a legitimate that's word. That's what 
Is that it, a good thing or is that a bad I'll thing? I'll tell you what, it's a beautiful thing. <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. It is. Know, right? the, it the, is. The it language is, is always evolving. Yeah. And that's what allows the language, just like just like jujitsu, just like yeah. mixed martial arts. Yeah. You want it to evolve. You want it to new words to come out that can articulate something a little bit better. Yeah. Like for instance, irregardless articulates that you don't know the English language very well. Well, yeah, yeah. but th- but yeah, at some point, a hundred years in the future, irregardless will become. A word that has a little bit of a different meaning than regardless like it's maybe it's more regardless yeah, yeah. like irregardless of what you're saying oh. and it will say first used in the you know somebody's gonna write an article in online or and it's gonna the guy's gonna misuse it but it, everyone's gonna understand it and yeah. it's gonna say first used here yeah there's all kinds of arguments you can have about language but you have to remember that it's evolving all the time our yeah. language is evolving all the time and it should in France they try not to let their language evolve yeah, yeah, they uh, try and keep that language. It's interesting. Or I wonder same. what the ultimate result is. Something like that would be, uh, brother. The word I think it's the same result if you try and not not evolve your martial arts. Yeah. Eventually, if you don't evolve your martial arts, you're going to lose. That's yeah, what I think. Huh? I think yeah. It's the same thing with language. Yeah, you become less effective uh, communication wise. Yeah. In language, as far as that goes. The word literally now. Okay, literally. We know what here. Here's the hard part about accepting this because literally means something very specific. Mm-hmm. There's no ambiguousness. If yeah. it started to be ambiguous, you wouldn't say literally. Yeah. You'd say figuratively, or you just won't say anything. That's what you. That's that's the defining characteristic of the word literally. But here's the thing. Now, literally doesn't mean literally. Literally means. Just r- almost a lot. Yeah, just really strong. Not even almost literary. Yeah. It's just really strong. So if if I was like, man, it, this guy's joke was so funny, I I was literally dying. Right? Yeah. I wasn't almost dying. It's not what it means. It just means it was super duper duper funny. Yeah. You know, that's, that's that a, one's changing. Yeah, man. The, but uh, that's a hard one to accept. Like, and all. And I think there's another word, but in America and California, this is a recent one. So maybe the. 80s everyone's st- in order to say said said like mm-hmm. or all mm-hmm. echo was like you got to stop doing this and i was, was all, all no way am i going to do that and that's just the way language evolves yeah dang that's cool hey man i dig it so nonetheless <laughs> if you want to buy this book regardless irregardless of the language in it mm, don't do that <laughs> <laughs> what i did was i made it easy you go to jockopodcast.com on the top menu whatever put a page there has all the books by episode this one is on there along with everything else just click through there it's a good way to support and you get you takes you to amazon you get your book in eight hours however long it takes to ship to your house good way to support also if you're doing other shopping if you're going to buy that lawnmower and leaf blower that you've been meaning to buy and the rake as well. Dude, um, false. You know, <laughs> I'm just saying. You're in the wrong time zone. I'm a wrong time of year for that. Oh, yeah. Wait, the rake. No, it's about to be spring. So yeah. what? A- you got another f- six months before you get the rake yeah. out and the lawn blower. Yeah. I just, that's one of the last things I, I bought was a leaf blower. Really? Yeah. Okay. Long story. Nonetheless, duct tape. That's your round thing. Yeah. So if you're going to get duct tape, duct tape, just carry on shopping, whatever you want to do. That's what, that's what you do. Good way to support. Also, subscribe to the podcast, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever else they have uh, podcasts and wherever else you want to listen to the podcast. They have like new podcast apps out too. Yeah. They all have them though. Yeah. And I dig it. So, hey, w- whatever you're using to listen, subscribe. Yeah. It's a good one. Seems obvious, I guess, on the listening part. But YouTube, not so much. We have a YouTube channel. Subscribe to that too. That's a good way to support if you want. Cause some people not into YouTube. Who's Still, not into YouTube? I don't know, but YouTube has some good heard, information on it. You can also waste a bunch of time on it. Yeah, yeah. It's like just it's yeah. It's like the internet in general. You know, a lot of True. good stuff. Like your whole like pursuit can be on the internet, and it can be very beneficial. And at the same time, your whole pursuit can be on the internet or YouTube, and it can be. Detrimental. What do you mean your pursuit? Like, well, whatever you're trying to do, going on the internet will will basically make it out. So, like, if you're trying, if you're trying to learn 3D modeling, mm-hmm. go on the internet. You can learn 3D modeling 100, well, not 100, percent but you can learn to be a professional 3D modeler on the internet. 
at the same time you get caught up watching some nonsense and not even take one step towards 3d <laughs> modeling so what i'm saying it's the dichotomy of the internet youtube has the same dichotomy but if you subscribe to the jocko podcast youtube channel there's no dichotomy there all good all good 100 <laughs> percent upside because it has a video version of the podcast it has excerpts and it has various other little videos we'll just sort of add mm-hmm I always say I'm going to add, but this time I think I'm really going to add a different type of video. Hmm. You'll see. It'll be good. Anyway, good way to support. Also, Jocko is a store. If you didn't already know, it's called Jocko Store. JockoStore.com. That's where you can get the shirt that Jocko's wearing right now. Victory MMA and Fitness. You don't even have to be a member of Vic- Victory MMA and Fitness. You, If you have the shirt, you're kind of a member. I yeah. Mean, at least in spirit. Yeah. yeah. You're a, a member in, in, a, yeah, in that sort of way. Nonetheless... It's on jockostore.com. It's where you can get any of the shirts that we make and sell. We also have hoodies on there and rash guards and hats and patches. A lot of good stuff. <laughs> Kids, women's, good stuff. I'm not saying to go buy something. I'm not saying that. I'm saying go there, jockostore.com. Check out the stuff. You want something, get something. And that's a good way to support. Also, psychological warfare. If you don't know what that is, which I know you do, but in the <laughs> unlikely event of you not knowing what that is, this is what it is. It's an album, not a music album. It's a spoken word album with tracks of Jocko helping us through weak points of our day, weak points of our campaign against weakness, weak points of our sh- struggle, struggle, good struggles, struggle for good. Sure. Struggle for good. That's what it is. <laughs> You know, the day you want, to, you, know, you want to sleep in or you want to cheat on the diet, you want to procrastinate, you want to skip the workout. That's the main one. That's the iconic one. Zero, Skipping the workout. Because you like to skip workouts. <laughs> uh, the, the rest of us are over here getting leg day. Uh, bro, I'm sure I did legs the other day. A good one. Didn't skip it. Psychological warfare, that's on iTunes. It well, helps you through it. Yeah. Some people, they don't know. So it's Jocko on each people track. Know. Bro, I'm telling you, sometimes they, they're like, wait, what is it? I didn't hear th- of this. Psychological warfare. Now they're not going to listen to the rest of this podcast. Bro, they will. It only has like two minutes, three, four, like tw- 25 minutes left. <laughs> I'm just saying. Psycho- psychological warfare is good. Almost done. If you want Jocko to help you, just put it in. That's how it originated. Check. It helped me not skip workouts. You can get it's it on iTunes. One. You can get it on Amazon Music. You can get it on Google Play and other podcasting or not no MP3. other MP3 yeah. uh, platforms. Providing platforms. <laughs> Also, if you're on Amazon, you can get something called Jocko White Tea. If you don't want to have your deadlift increase to a minimum of 8,000 pounds, then don't get Jocko White Tea. You can get the books. Yeah, the books that we cover on the podcast, which are all listed on the website. You can also get a couple books that you might want to check out. One of them is called Way of the Warrior Kid. I actually wrote that book. It teaches kids to make their lives better, to get on the path and work hard. There's another book coming out. It's actually available on Amazon right now. Well, you can't get it yet, but you can pre-order it. If you wanna spread the word, you pre-order it. That makes more people see it, so that's cool. It's called Way of the Warrior Kid, Mark's Mission. Nice. Little follow-up to Way of the Warrior Kid. Different lessons to be learned. So you can check that out. If you want to check out an actual warrior kid, you can go and get some Jocko soap from young Aiden. 12 years old, no big deal. You know what he's doing? Making soap. He has his own business. You can get that at irishoaksranch.com. Like I said, a 12-year-old kid making goat milk soap. You know why? You know why I did that? You can't sell goat milk in California. Yeah, yeah. But you can sell goat soap. Goat milk soap, yeah, for yeah. sure. So he wanted to make some good ones, so you can check that out as well. The Discipline Equals Freedom Field Manual. It's about getting after it. There's really nothing more to say. Mm-hmm. If you, I've gotten a lot of great feedback from that book, so I appreciate it. And once you feel that you've gotten what you can out of it, loan it to somebody. So they can get on the path too. Maybe they'll get their own or get it for them. Whatever, mm-hmm. it's your choice. Important part of that: everyone wants the audio version of that book. The Discipline Equals Freedom Field Manual is 
not on audible it's on itunes amazon music google play other mp3 platforms and it also is an album that has tracks some people say with tracks extreme ownership the new edition is out thank you for helping us put the new to get new edition together because we've got questions from this podcast a new forward but we've also got pictures for our question from the podcast in there extreme ownership combat leadership how to get out there and lead and win for on-site leadership instruction and consulting you can bring our company echelon front to your organization we solve problems through leadership simple as that you got a problem the way you get the problem solved is through leadership it's me it's Leif Babin it's JP to it's Dave Burke email info at echelonfront.com or you can go through the website echelonfront.com there's also the muster leadership seminar with the echelon front team we're only doing two this year I'm gonna try and get a bunch of questions that I get asked all the time I'm gonna try and get rid of those questions right now we're only doing two musters this year we aren't going to New York City we aren't going to Texas we aren't going to Florida we aren't going to your hometown I'm sorry we just can't we can't go to every town in America to do a muster we're only doing two of them this year we're doing one in Washington DC so there's an East Coast and a West Coast one is in Washington DC it's May 17th and 18th we're doing another one in San Francisco October 17th and 18th so if you want to come to a muster you got to come to one of those two we're not going to Omaha we're not going to Milwaukee I want to go there but unfortunately we can't just get to all those different places so apologize thus far there has been four musters that we've done over the past year and a half they all sold out these two musters are going to sell out as well so if you want to come and you want to learn pragmatic leadership skills and strategies then you can go to extremeownership.com and you can register we will see you there echo charles will also be there and until you get to the muster if you have questions for us or you have answers for us we're looking for both we're here and we are cruising hard actually on the interwebs on Twitter Instagram and on the fish echo is at echo Charles and I am at Jocko Willink and finally thanks to those people out there that make this podcast possible and by that I mean first and foremost our military men and women who go into harm's way to protect our freedom and our way of life thanks to you and also to the police out there holding the thin blue line thanks for protecting us here on the home front to the firefighters paramedics and other first responders thanks for being ready to come out and rescue us anytime day or night and to everyone else that is listening thank you for listening thank you for sharing thank you for supporting the podcast because we appreciate we appreciate all that but more important we appreciate going down this path with all of you so keep putting one foot in front of the other as you move down this path keep making the decisions the right decisions even on the little things keep attacking pushing pursuing without cease and most of all keep getting after it so until next time this is echo and jocko out